Timothy chapter and 10. US Lagos flagship chapter. Thank you. Um, my name is QS Lola Deshokoya, and this morning I'm not doing this alone. With me is QS Asan Koli. He's a, he's a strong man of uh, mechanical services, he's very versatile. We are starting the program by recognizing our elders in the house that has um, come to, to be with us. We are not taking light the support of everyone that is here, but we just have to recognize some of us above some. So this morning I'm starting with the president of the Nigeria Institute of Quantity Surveyor. He's a man of many parts. He's a fellow of the Institute. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of um, Arbitrator. And he's here this morning. We'll be calling him to the high table right now. Give us a battle, please. A round of applause, please. I think he deserves a, a, a standing ovation. It's not easy. To, to be the president and uh, practically everywhere your children are doing something you just have to be there you have to make yourself available to support everyone thank you sir he's not here alone we are going to recognize the presence of the secretary general of the institute and the person of QS, Aminu Basha, FNI QS. You are welcome, sir. We also recognize the presence of the Assistant General Secretary of the Institute, QS Roti Miojelade. You are welcome. Thank you. And we do not take it lightly because she's someone that is all supportive. She's an all-rounder when it comes to supporting the work of QS, the profession as a whole. So I recognize the presence of QS Mrs. Yetunde Simplis, FNI QS. You're welcome, ma. 
and also representing Kiwezake Ushola, the permanent secretary for the Ministry of uh, Housing, Lagos State, is um, Mr. Shadari Kayode James. He's the director of ADMI and HR, Lagos State Ministry of Housing. You're welcome, sir. Um, Mrs. Kiwez uh, Okusaga was with us shortly now. I don't know. If she, I think she stood up. She's a former um, treasurer for the institute, national treasurer. We'll give due recognition when she comes back in. And I want to recognize um, past Senate members of legal state that are run. We thank you for your support. We thank you for that every time that we call on you, you're always around, despite the fact that you are no more in the Senate. So go right in now. We are going to call in. And I also recognize my chairman, QS Ayodele Alao, is the QS, the number one QS in Lagos State. You're welcome, sir. So we are going right in and because the, the keynote speaker is uh, joining us online and is, is already standing by. So we'll call on, we'll call on Professor Isaac Olani Yaje. He's been ably represented by Q is I or did you okay? Okay. So call on you start to please come up. You're welcome, sir. You read it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hassan Kohli. I am the co-moderator with um, QS Shokoya Lolade. Uh, I welcome you all to the 13th Annual Distinguished Lecture Series. So we have officially commenced, and very soon we will drive right in into the program. And to start with, we have on the high podium here our first uh, speaker who is representing Professor Isaac Olani Yaje. Professor Isaac Olani Yaje is a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Conservation. Okay, permit me to. Sorry, we, uh, we are sorry, we are starting with the keynote speaker because already stand by online so that we can move. As the other discussant comes in, we will, we will call them up. So we'll start with the keynote speaker. Okay, starting with the keynote speaker. The keynote speaker today is Dr. Andrew Nevin. Dr. Andrew Nevin is a partner financial services leader and chief economist at PwC West Africa. Andrew started his career at McKinsey and Company, serving in Toronto and Paris offices. Before joining PwC, he spent 10 years living in China and was the president of United Family Hospital China's preeminent international hospital chain during the SARS crisis in 2003 through to early 2005. While in PwC UK, United Kingdom, prior to joining the PwC Nigeria, Andrew led the writing of PwC's global response to the 2008 great financial crisis titled Day After Tomorrow and subsequently, he developed PwC's global mega-trends perspective 
known as Project Blue. Andrew advocates for the changes that will unlock Nigeria's enormous human and economic potential. In addition to being continuously in the Nigerian media, he has been quoted in the Financial Times, The Economist, Bloomberg, Forbes, and Newsweek. Andrew is one of PwC's leading global thinkers, working at the complex intersection of economics, strategy, capital markets, and investment. He has more than three decades of professional experience as an entrepreneur, private equity investor, line manager, economist, and strategy consultant. And he is a professional career. He has lived in Asia, North America, and Europe. He has been at the forefront of advocacy for, for innovation in Nigeria. Some of his innovation, innovatives is he is one of the leading advocates for blockchain technology adoption in Nigeria. Also, he is the co-founder of Binkabi, a blockchain-enabled trading platform trying to increase the incomes of the 500 million farmers in developing countries. He is also a co-founder of Icon, a Nigerian company focused on bringing a unique Canadian solar energy technology to Nigeria. Andrew is the founding governor Financial Center for Sustainability Lagos, a body that was founded to promote sustainable finance in the capital market across West Africa. He is also the founding director of the African Institute for Leadership and Public Administration. He is also a member of the advisory board at Lagos Business School. He has led several writings, presented several uh, several write-ups, uh, part of which is bringing dead capital to life, what Nigerians should be doing 2019, which discusses how real estate and other assets that are dead in the Nigerian economy and hindering growth of the private sector. He also uh, wrote another paper for PwC, Strength from Abroad, which was talking about how inward remittances were much bigger source of foreign exchange than oil. Uh, to cap it all, Andrew is a renowned economist globally and locally, and he has contributed a lot to several parts of the world, and recently, in the last decade, he has been championing all of these uh, initiatives in Nigeria. Join me in welcoming online uh, Dr. Andrew S. Nevin. Let's put, around, let's put our hands together for him. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can all hear you. Please go ahead with your presentation. Well, thank you, Hassan. So that, that's such a, a lovely introduction. I just uh, really appreciate it. And also, but let me stand on existing protocols. Um, but say what a, a pleasure and honor it is to be with the quantity surveyors here this morning. I mean, particularly as we'll talk about, I mean, I've always viewed real estate at the center of what has to happen in Nigeria. And of course, quantity surveyors are at the, at the center of what happens in real estate in many, you know, many, many, many dimensions on that. And it's a fantastic profession. I mean, one of the things that I've often said in Nigeria is that the professional bodies are really a powerful force for good, whether it's the, the accountants, which of course PwC, I'm not an accountant, but we have many of, or the lawyers, but the quantity surveyors are certainly in that group. And I've, I've been with you before and thank you so much. Um, so today I'm gonna to get things kicked off. Um, I'm gonna talk, a little, this talk is of course meant to be, you know, what's the role of professionals in moving Nigeria forward? 
Um, so I'm going to share with you some perspective on some of the big economic themes that we're thinking about, but also related to the role that the quantity surveyors can, can play in all this, because you have a, a big role on that. I have to say, though, I'm coming in today, I, I don't want to say I'm a little bit discouraged, but I think we are all aware of um, how challenging the situation is uh, uh, globally and how challenging the situation is in Nigeria, of course, at a global level. We still have the, the pandemic. Some countries seem to think that it's over, but our, our, our brothers and sisters in South Africa are suffering greatly right now from the pandemic. Uh, I am going to touch a little bit on climate change, particularly a um, uh, big issue for, for me today, and I think for the globe as we watch the temperatures hit 50 degrees in Canada. Um, and of course, we have our challenges in Nigeria that we're all, all aware of. And I think that the major theme I want to leave with with all of us today is as as difficult as these days seem, I, I remain optimistic about the world and particularly about Nigeria, my home, um, because I, I think that you know, in one way we have no choice but to make things better. And as I said, I mean, the professional bodies play an enormous role in making, you know, making the country better. And I'm going to ask each of you to play your role in doing that, because if you don't fix Nigeria, no one else uh, is going to. So. Let me, though, start by sharing these themes for you. Let's see if I can get, um, get figure out how to share the, 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 there we go. I'll try that, share my screen with you. Um, Sorry, just bear with me one, one moment here. Okay, can everyone see my, my screen? Okay, so I just, I'm going to just share with you the top 10 things for the Nigerian economy, um, which we think are important. And I think, as I said, I'm going to relate it to, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to relate it to um, NIQS, uh, in fact, and with the role that quantity sur surveyors have to pay, play on this. So, so, and I'll take maybe about uh, 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes in total. But let me start out by saying that, you know, too often I think we, we hear about other countries and other countries' developments, and then we try to take the lessons to Nigeria. Uh, so I hear about Singapore, I hear about uh, South Korea, I hear about Rwanda. Um, I guess one of the messages that we want to give the country is Nigeria's circumstances are unique. We're at a unique time in history, uh, and Nigeria needs to find its own development path. And I don't think it's going to look like any other countries. Um, that said, the one country that we actually think has a lot of lessons for Nigeria is not Singapore, it's not Rwanda, it's not South Korea, it's not the United States, it's actually India. And why is that? Because India has faced many of the same challenges. It's a very a large country, a huge population of 1.4 billion, cleavage is along religious lines. Uh, cleavages along tribal lines, uh, uh, cleavages along ge geography, very widely varying terrain around uh, India, and of course, very different levels of development in parts of the country. So while Nigeria is going to find its own path, um, we do think that looking at India is, is useful for, for thinking about Nigeria. So, but let me go through, as I said, I had 10, 10 themes for you. Um, these are the 10 themes. I'm just going to have one slide on each theme that we can run through quickly, but I hope it gives a picture of the way I think we should think about the development of Nigeria. And I want to start with one, of course, that's very dear to the hearts of everyone in the audience today. It's a quantity of surveyors, you're right in the heart of that. Uh, Hassan mentioned that um, you know, we'd written the paper around dead assets, dead capital uh, on there, and we can't emphasize enough that no, if Nigeria does not unlock its dead capital, we're not going to have um, inclusive and sustained growth that, that deals with unemployment and poverty. So, of course, a lot of that's around housing. Uh, here we have 7 million units of housing in the housing deficit. We need to build 700,000 uh, units a year. Obviously, this has some 
things that have to happen at the federal level. It has some things that have to happen at the state uh, state level on that. Um, but if, you know, you ask what role do you play? I mean, the quantities of surveyors have to be right at the heart of all the lobbying and the the, the pressure on the different um, government entities to get the right policies in place to do this. But there is no way for Nigeria to be economically successful unless the housing market works. So people can buy houses on mortgage, they can be secure in um, in, in the process of, of buying a house. Uh, if they put a deposit down, the house is delivered. There's a mortgage available for it. The titling is clear on it. And of course, from the, from the quantity surveyor's perspective, it also means that the quality of the housing is, is appropriate. People are building to appropriate standards. And in fact, this is another area I think where Nigeria needs to find its own path because the building has to be to standards that work in the tropical climate or the different climates that we have in Nigeria, not necessarily the way it's built in colder climates on that. So you guys are right at the heart of this dead capital issue um, and I think you should be playing a, a big role in influencing all of the stakeholders but particularly the the government at both the state level and the federal level to unlock the dead capital to unlock the housing housing market um, we mentioned remittances before and again I think that, that you have a huge role to play in creating a system where the diaspora feels more comfortable investing in Nigeria. I mean, you're all aware of, uh, I'm sure, many diasporans that support their families in building building out houses, building out real estate on that. But that process is still quite informal. There needs to be more formalization of the way that the diaspora can participate, both to help their own families, but also to invest more generally, particularly in real estate. So what role do you have in making it safe to invest for the diaspora? Um, and that's going to significantly increase the flow. So, I mean, roughly the official flows are about $25 billion a year in 2019, maybe a bit less during um, COVID. They're going to bounce back strongly on that. And they really are, as we've argued, the biggest foreign exchange um, earner on that. But uh, you, again, have to be right at the heart of creating a trust-based system where the diaspora is going to participate in this. Um, a third area, which I think is very interesting, is, you know, we've come out and, and of course, there's a lot of talk about diversification um, um, uh, out there and that the need, we all understand the need for Nigeria to diversify. Now, um, the diaspora, in a sense, is already an export, is an export of Nigerian brains. So people leave Nigeria. We have this happen you know, between five and 10 times a month at PwC, in fact, in Nigeria, where people leave off into Canada right now. And of course, they then um, send remittances back. But that's not ideal because we have a little bit of a brain drain. We don't want people to feel like they have to leave the country to have opportunities. So what's happening now, however, is that there's more and more exports of services without people leaving Nigeria because of particularly with COVID accelerating and people can work remotely. They can be part of global value chains while sitting in, in Nigeria. And in fact, this may be something that quantity surveyors eventually get uh, involved in. I don't know if anyone in this group is in part of any kind of global company that does quantity surveying where you can process the information in Nigeria on behalf of a global a global situation. Um, but that again would be an export of services. And what we're advocating is actually the export of services is a better route for Nigeria right now than the export of physical goods. And you know, why is that? Well, the physical goods suffer from everything we all understand, the situation at the ports, the situation uh, on the roads, the power situation, uh, SON, like the, the standardization, hitting the physical goods standard is not easy on that. So while we tend to think of diversification exports in goods terms, we're trying to get people to think of it more in terms of services. And again, India was a very good example of how that really made the country lift uh, three or 400 million people out of poverty on that. So that's our third theme. Fourth theme, and again, I think is very critical, maybe not, well, I think for all quantity surveyors, I know this is the Lagos chapter of the quantity surveyors, um, but one of the things that's very critical in the country is that um, uh, that there's inclusive growth everywhere. Uh, it is not sufficient for Lagos to grow. And in fact, I'm sure everyone here today understands that the stresses that are coming from Lagos is relative economic success. So you have Lagos population growing perhaps four to four to five percent a year. There's uh, some projection that Lagos will have 88 million people, a population in 2100, which I, I don't 
really understand how it could ever happen. Um, but the, the conclusion from all this is that we need innovation everywhere in the country. So we need it in, 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 in wealth, wealth creation, uh, activity that attracts young people for jobs. We need the real estate development, innovation hubs, industrial clusters, universities, secondary education everywhere. We need it in Sokoto. We need it in Mina. We need it in Calabar. Um, so across across the country on that. And again, I think you you have a, a big role because, of course, as I said, you know, people today at the Lagos chapter, but of course, the quantity surveyors are around the country. You have to have a very strong professional um, body of quantity surveyors in every state if they're going to be economically economically successful. Now, this, I think, is something that really is kind of at the heart of some of our, our challenges here. What this chart shows is the level of investment in Nigeria, or sorry, for three countries, for Nigeria, China, and India. And you can see um, the yellow line is, is India, and they invest every year about 28 to 30 percent of their GDP back into the economy. Um, and they used to only invest about 22 percent. And of course, now they get a uh, growth rate of about 6 to 8% in GDP terms. Unfortunately, Nigeria has seen a declining investment rate in the last decade, and we only invest about 18 to 19% back in the economy. The problem is when you only invest 18 to 19%, you'll only get 2% growth, and that's what we're seeing. And of course, 2% growth means that we're getting poorer and poorer per capita because our population growth is about 3%. So we got poor and poor per capita 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, probably 2021 as well. Uh, I hope eventually by 2022, we can turn this around. But we need people to want to invest in Nigeria. And it's a very, the critical question we've always challenged the federal government on is, why do people not want to invest in Nigeria? It's the biggest economic story on the planet. It has the most potential for wealth creation. We have negative interest rates across much of the world. And despite all of those positive conditions, people still are not investing enough in Nigeria. And unless we solve this issue, we're going to continue to have more and more people in poverty and more and more people uh, un un unemployed, underemployed, and all the problems that creates for the young population of Nigeria. Um, so then how does this fit with the quantity surveyors? Well, you know, the quantity surveyors are like right at the heart of investment decisions I mean, about everything, but particularly around real estate and the role that you play in you know, cost estimates and control of that process is so critical to that. If there's more confidence in real estate, as I said, than every sector, I mean, the entire economy will start to float up on that. And you are right at the heart of that. But you need to play a role in getting this investment rate up from 18 to 19% to closer to 30%. Uh, moving the informal sector to the formal sector. So 50, over 50% 50 of the Nigerian economy is informal. That is, it's not a terrible thing in the sense that an informal economy is better than, a, than nothing. Um, but the problem is in the informal economy, productivity is low, investment is low. Um, so people who are in the informal economy uh, you know, stay in poverty, essentially, on that. And we need to shift people from the informal sector to the formal sector. Now, the problem is that's a choice for people. So the question that we pose to the federal government in particular, well, to both state and federal government, is how do you get people to move from the informal to the formal economy? People want to have to do that voluntarily because it's a, a choice. And of course, this is actually now on the agenda. You see a lot more thought at the federal government level from the ministry, the, the Honorable Minister of um, Finance, Budget and National Planning. And you also see a number of states. I, I'll cite a number of states as one, for example, that's made real efforts because they recognize even the people in the inf informal economy, it's ultimately going to be much better in the long term for Nigeria. Ease of doing business. I think everyone here really appreciates how critical this is. Um, and of course, one of the major measures in the ease of doing business is the whole the way real estate is done. So building, construction, permit, land transfer, you're at the heart of all of those uh, processes um, in, your, in your role as quantity surveyors. Um, we're still not where we need to be. I think we need to be, in my view, at least 60 or 70 at worst on that. So we've got about 50 points to go on the global scale, but it's possible. I mean, uh, Rwanda's obviously done it. Kenya is doing very well. Ghana is starting to make some moves on that. Um, and Dr. Jamoke at the PEBEC at the national level is just brilliant. 
um, on that. So I think we're making strides there. We have some way to go, but again, you have a, a role to play in, in, in pressuring and you know creating the the you know, pushing the federal government and state level governments to, to particularly around the land issues make them work better for the country okay we can't talk about the economy without talking about the three big distortions um, we're all aware of them exchange rate fuel subsidy power the fuel subsidy in particular is really on the agenda right now um, in, in in the press I mean, we've come out with um, NNPC is saying that the, as a result of the kind of arbitrage and smuggling activities with neighboring West African states, the subsidy is subsidizing about um, 100 million liters of fuel a day when the consumption in, in Nigeria is less than 60 on that. Uh, the cost is enormous. It's hard to see in my economics role this being sustainable for very much longer. On the, certainly on the fuel side, when price was 30 to 35 dollars for oil, seeing we can eliminate the subsidy with the devaluation and the price of uh, crude doubling, very difficult. But we also have similar subsidies in the exchange or, or distortions in the exchange rate in the power. We've made small steps to making it um, uh, deliberalize the, these uh, liberalizing these these co these prices. It's difficult to see Nigeria able to move forward though while we continue to have these distortions. I mean, particularly if you take the exchange rate, the uh, it, it, the people that have access to dollars at 380 or 390 are now 411 versus 500 in the parallel market. It just breeds such an incredible. Uh, incentive for kind of round tripping and other other behaviors that are not conducive to moving the economy forward. So while we're not, I'm not a big fan of complete liberalization in many cases. In these subsidized situations, it's hard to see any way forward without without dealing with the subsidies or the distortions. Now, this is an area I think where Nigeria is really ahead of much of the world on that, which is. You know, we've always had this view, and I've used it even in this talk today about uh, GDP growth, 2%, 3%, 6%, 8%, um, and higher GDP growth being being good. But, you know, it's possible to have high GDP growth, as Nigeria did from 2010 to 2014, without people's lives, or many people's lives getting better. So a much better way, we think, to look at, at the world is to ask, really, are people's lives good? Are they getting better? Are we addressing the fundamental issues? And the language that's being used increasingly for this uh, is the uh, Sustainable Development Goal language. So the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And the reason the language is so powerful is because you re when you look at each goal, you realize it really gets at the heart of what people really need and want in their life. So no poverty is a very intuitive concept. You don't, no one wants to be in poverty. We don't want anyone in poverty. We don't want anyone hungry. We want people to get quality education. We want reduced inequalities, you know, life below water. So every one of these SDG goals really touches something that's important to all of us. Uh, decent work and economic growth, um, infrastructure, affordable and clean energy. I mean, for the for quantity surveyors, sustainable cities and communities. So how do we build in a way that is uh, matches SDG 11 on that. And I think this is a very powerful force. And as I said, Nigeria is um, ahead of much of the world on it. We have, um, and the government is really, at both level, at all levels, has really done a very good job. For example, in Lagos, we have Shalape Hammond, a uh, brilliant young Nigerian who's the essay to the, um, uh, His Excellency the Governor on SDG. She's a real tour de force. Of course, we have the ex, the, her, the, um, her Excellency, who was the Deputy Governor of Lagos in the last administration, who's now the Senior Special Advisor to His Excellency President Buhari on SDGs on that. So I think this is one area where Nigeria is doing incredibly well. And we would like to encourage the country to continue to think about things that really matter. Not so, even though I stand up and talk about we need GDP growth of six to eight percent, what we really need are the continued focus on, on the SDGs on that. And I think, again, the quantity surveyors have a real role to play on a number of these SDGs. I mean, in terms of number six, clean water and sanitation. The energy systems, the power, uh, real estates, and number seven, sustainable communities and cities. And of course, also decent work because your efforts drive a lot of employment around construction, the plumbers, the electricians, and all of the people that support that. So incredibly powerful way to think about things. And we really encourage it. 
And then I just, I need to end on something that I think is a very uh, difficult subject right now. And it's particularly in my mind um, in the last few days, as I mentioned before, you might've seen the news that the temperatures in uh, part of Canada, the Western part today may touch 50 degrees centigrade. And there's an unprecedented heat wave, something that could not have happened prior to the kind of carbonization of the environment we've had for you know, for decades now, it may be reaching a tipping point. Um, you know, so we've had a very difficult time with COVID. It's of course caused a you know, economic calamity around much of the world. Um, and even in Nigeria, we did relatively well, but the economy shrunk 2% from 2019 to 2020. But we have something even bigger looming, which is which is climate change. And unless we get a hold of this, I'm just not quite sure what the future holds um, for for humanity. As I said, you know, we have these extreme weather events happening right now in Canada and parts of the western United States, the northwest United States. Um, you know, we're seeing this all over the world, Australia as well, the Arctic, uh, both the Russian Arctic, the Canadian Arctic. Uh, here's a picture from the Arctic where we should be normally having at this time of year um, uh, starting to form ice and we're not. Um, but it's something that touches Nigeria as, as well. So this is uh, one study that looks at what percentage of people in the country will be underwater if uh, global temperatures rise uh, 2%. And you can see, if you look at this, that uh, according to this study, that Nigeria is colored in the um, light blue, which is the sort of 10 to 25% band, which basically means most of the Delta and all of Lagos would be, would be underwater. And so we have the uh, encroaching sea from the south. We also have the conflicts that are caused by the encroaching uh, Sahara from the, from the north. So in a sense, squeezing the, the middle of, of Nigeria. So while we hear the stories about other parts of the world, the truth is that the, the impact of climate change is already affecting, affecting Nigeria. Um, and you know, part, of the, part of the adaption to this, because we can't necessarily stop all of this, but part of the adaption is the way buildings are constructed and you know, the, the features of buildings that are more resilient, uh, the materials that are used. And in that sense, I think, I mean, you have um, complete um, uh, role to play in the mitigation factors that are gonna come, that are required for climate change in Nigeria. Humans, not just Nigerians, we all understand that these things are connected. So this is kind of the latest um, sort of risk matrix from the World Economic Forum. And you can see there's some things that we might have thought were happening in the future, which are happening now, but climate change action failures at the center. We get biodiversity loss, food crises, water crises, involuntary migration, extreme weather. All of these things are things that are happening in, in Nigeria today. So not just as quantity surveyors, but as leading professionals in Nigeria, you know, everyone in this room has a role to play in how, how Nigeria and the world reacts to this. So let me let me stop there. I, I'm sorry I don't have any uh, better news for us today. As I said, I mean, despite all the challenges that um, that um, that we see in the world today, I, I, I remain optimistic. But I think that what is you know when when I was asked to speak at this event, what attracted me was the fact that the question that was on the table was what role can quantity surveyors as professionals play in addressing these immense challenges of this time. And the way I would summarize it is I think that the quantity surveyors have a particular role as quantity surveyors uh, on many of the issues which we discussed, obviously around unlocking the housing potential, around the building resiliency into cities and communities, as discussed in the SDG role, uh, goals, but also in terms of relating to the climate change issue. Um, and of course, help with many of the SDG uh, goals, uh, uh, communities, employment, etc. But you also, as professionals, as I said before, I've always, and I've, I've written about this, uh, it's incredibly powerful in Nigeria, the, um, um, the, the, these professional bodies. And what I would urge you to do is to use the power of this body combined with other professional groups to help make the change that's needed in Nigeria. Because collectively between the quantity surveyors, the lawyers, the architects, the accountants, 
the stockbrokers, all of these groups put together it can make uh, can make positive change. So let me stop there and say it's been a real honor. Uh, just, uh, you know, as I said, we've shared some of the ideas that we're thinking about in terms of the economy of PwC and the big issues on that. Um, so and I hope it's been helpful. But please, please keep the climate change issue at the center of all you do as individuals and all you do as a as a group in the uh, in the Institute of Quantity Surveyors. So thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Dr. Andrew Nevin. We, one thing that struck me is the last um, uh, statement. He said, having heard all this, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you did not know. And that is the main reason why we are here today. Uh, we are sorry that we had to jump the program to quickly take um, doctor, um, because he's been online for a while. So we're going back to our program on page 12 before we start to take the discussion. So I'm officially welcoming you again to the 13th Annual Distinguished Lecture Series with the theme, Economic Recovery and Provision of Sustainable Infrastructure and Meet Security Challenges in Nigeria, the Role of Professionals in the Built Environment. So welcome everybody. And in starting, uh, I want to recognize um, the presence of uh, the past president of the Nigeria Institute of Quantum Surveyor, uh, QS Francis Adetola. You're welcome, sir. Can you please come to the front, sir? We appreciate you. Please, sir. Thank you, sir. A round of applause for him. Also recognizing the presence of QS Akim Smith, the chairman of the Association of Consulting Quantum Surveyors and the chairman of the um, Public Schools Renovation uh, Committee of the Lagos State uh, Government. You are welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Also recognizing QS Jide Oke. He is the past chairman of the Lagos chapter and the former mom member of NEC. You are welcome, sir. Thank you for coming. Thank you so very much. So coming back to our program, we're going to go back to number six, which is the welcome address by the host of this um, event. QS Ayodele Alao, FNI QS, the chairman, Nigeria Institute of Quantum Surveyor, Lagos Chapter. Well, I think at this point I'm permitted to take off my mask. It's not been easy with the mask, though. Uh, the president, Nigerian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, QS, Mohamed Abato, FNIQS, who is also the chief host and chairman of this occasion. You're welcome, sir. Uh, I'd like to, represent, uh, to recognize the deputy president, NIQS, QS, Olayemi Shonubi, FNIQS, um, the secretary general, QS, Dr. Aminu Bashiru, you're welcome. I also recognize the presence of the Assistant Secretary General and the person of um, QS, Rutimi or Jelade. You're welcome. Um, my special recognition goes to all members of the National Executive Council. Some of them are still on their way, I guess. All past presidents of the Institute here present. All past chairmen of the flagship chapter here present all chairman of other chapters present. Um, the keynote speaker, Dr. Andrew S. Nevin, who we have just listened to. Um, I also recognize, even though represented, the presence of the permanent secretary, Ministry of Housing, Lagos State, and the person of QS Wasiu Akewishala, FNI QS, who is ably represented by Mr. Shadari Kayode James. All fellows of the Institute, gentlemen of the press, 
distinguished well-wishers of the NIKS Lagos chapter and the NIKS at large. I won't leave out our panel of discussants. Uh, I don't want to mention your names now until the moderators bring you to the podium. Well, this is the 13th edition of the, in the series of the Lagos Chapter Distinguished Lecture Series, and it gladdens my heart that we are back to hosting this event physically. This lecture series has been established as an awareness and marketing tool of the chapter, and every year, the Senate organizes this coming together discussions on burning issues in the polity and how um, it affects us as well as our quantity surveying profession can contribute uh, as we will be discussing. I'd like to, at this moment, request that we all give another resounding applause to the initiators of this program. That was 13 years back. The vision is very, very clear even as of now. Thank you very much. This year we are discussing economic recovery and provision of sustainable infrastructure amidst security challenges in Nigeria, the role of the professional in the built environment. We have heard recently that the economy is recovering and witnessing growth. We must also have heard that the same economy has shrunk. And just yesterday, I read that there is a new report authored by the World Bank indicating that a full decade of economic growth in Nigeria is likely to be lost by the end of 2021. And of course, so many other distorted bits um, that we tend to misrepresent as facts. We also are all aware that there is a varying dimension of security challenges in virtually every part of the nation. In and around all of this, the deficit in provision of sustainable infrastructure is still substantially unabated in spite of the efforts of various successive administrations in Nigeria. However, we cannot fold our hands as professionals as a lot of the burden of finding lasting solutions rests on us. And in light of the aforestated, I will enjoin us all to pay rapt attention to the discourse we will be having this morning as we hope to take something or some things away from this place. And on behalf of the Senate and members of the Lagos chapter of the Nigerian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, we express our profound appreciation to the members of the Executive Council present, led by the President, QS Mohamed Abato, FNI QS, for gracing this occasion and accepting to be the chief host and chairman of the event. We also recognize all our special and distinguished guests and members of the Institute. On that note, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Tatint. Uh, distinguished lecture series of the NIQS Lagos chapter. Whilst we will be broadening our knowledge and mind, let us also enjoy this once in a session occasion. Once again, you are all welcome. God bless the Lagos chapter of the NIQS. God bless the NIQS. God bless the QS profession. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, QS and Ayodele Alao. We want to recognize um, the presence of QS uh, Adekemi Okusaga. She is a former NEC member and a former um, quantity of women in quantity of a waxing former chairperson. You are welcome. We're going to call on the chief host, the chairman of the occasion, the president, Nigerian Institute of Quantum Surveyor, to give his opening remarks. Like I said, we are going back to the program. It's, um, from now, we follow it uh, strictly so that we can live here on time, too. Kiwa is Abatosa, your opening remarks.
the past president of NIQS, my mentor here with us, if, uh, past president Ajitola, we are so happy to have you today. Members of the National Executive Council here are present. My elders that are seated, it is our pleasure having all of you. Fellows of the Institute, most distinguished colleagues, gentlemen of the press here present. I want to, at this point, rely on the protocol competently established by the chairman of the flagship chapter. I want to begin by commending Lagos chapter of NIQS for not only trailblazing, but being steadfast and consistent in organizing annual distinguished lecture series in which discussions are being made on contemporary issues that are germane to national development. I thought a few other chapters ever since, such as FCT, Kano, Kaduna, just to mention a few, have keyed into this concept. I wish to recommend this initiative to other chapters across the country, which signifies our modest contribution to nation building. Uh, again, I want to join the chairman to appreciate the creators and initiators of this program I've been sure. Again, commendations to them. Both applause. Let us appreciate them more. <laughs> the theme selected for today, i.e. economic recovery and provision of sustainable infrastructure amid security challenges in Nigeria, the role of professionals in the built environment could not have come at a better time. It was well thought out and diligently packaged. The resource persons made up of erudite scholars, practitioners, and technocrats lined up for the event will do justice to the theme. There is no excess between stock of infrastructure and economic development. As professionals, therefore, we join other stakeholders to call upon governments at various levels to prioritize provision and maintenance of infrastructure such as power, transportation, education, health, etc. as quick wins to fast track the economic development of Nigeria. Our products and services will be more competitive in the global market, thereby providing employment to our teeming youth and reducing insecurity. From that perspective, therefore, one can notice the links between infrastructure, economic development, and insecurity. Once again, well done NIQS Lagos chapter. We are very proud of your sustained efforts. <laughs> Professionals are expected to be the conscious of any society, and Nigeria cannot be an exception. You should collectively resolve to serve as good reference and influencers of policies in the country. Professionals in the built environment are doing their best within given constraints and daunting challenges. The challenges of which all of us are aware. But we shouldn't lose hope. Lose hopes. I'm also optimistic, just like the keynote speaker, that we can push through all those daunting challenges. We, shall, we should strive to do more through continuous quality improvement. And that is what we are doing today in terms of capacity building and deepening knowledge base of our practices. Quantity surveyors play pivotal roles in national development as experts trained to provide total cost and procurement management of capital projects from conception to commissioning and maintenance in all sectors of the economy, thereby ensuring value for money. Some of the roles include prudent costing of projects, procurement planning, budgetary implementation, post-contract auditing, alternative dispute resolution, project management, and project cost monitoring in the construction industry. These statements are for participants here present and are not quantity surveys. Our core values include transparency, accountability, probity, value for money, and professional competence. 
Quantity surveyors ensure and insist on delivering value for money to clients through optimal utilization of scarce resources. An important component of the rebranding program presently being implemented entails exploring better tools and techniques of achieving customer satisfaction, thereby contributing to national growth and development. One of such tools is resource scheduling, which was the theme of the recently held zonal workshop. Mainstreaming resource scheduling tool as a regular component of quantity surveying service offerings will ensure proper planning and effective deployment of scarce resources by clients engaged while executing projects, especially in the informal sector. Again, a modest contribution of NIQS to national development. I am very confident that at the end of this lecture, we shall be more enlightened and better equipped to face developmental challenges. Once again, on behalf of the National Executive Council, I wish to express profound appreciation and gratitude to invited guests, resource persons, other participants, ladies and gentlemen of the press for finding time to honor us by attending this very important event. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you. Another resounding applause for the president, Nigerian Institute of Corn Surveyors. Please let's clap very well again. Let's put our hands together. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on now, we're moving on to the main discussion of today. But before we do that, I'd like to invite to the uh, podium here one of our discussants who has been with us since morning, uh, Engineer Mrs. Olayinka Abdul. Please come up. Let's give our hands, let's put our hands together for her, please. Also, before we move to the main discussion of the day, we would like to recognize the online presence of the Deputy President, Nigerian Institute of County Surveyors, the person of QS Olayemi Shonubi. Let's put our hands together for him, please. Also present online is the Secretary, Marketing and Corporate Affairs, the Nigerian Institute of County Surveyors, QS Aderonke Oyelami. Let's put our hands together, please. Also recognizing the online presence of Deputy Chairperson Waxing Women Association of County Surveyors of Nigeria, Madam QS Priscilla Akabudike. Let's put our hands together for her, please. So now we'd like to call on, we'd like to read the citation of Professor Isaac. Olani Yaje, who is going to be our first discussant for today. Professor Isaac Aje is an erudite scholar. He, is, he has served as consultant conservator to over 60 construction projects in Ondo State and Nigeria at large. He was a member of the contract assessment panel constituted by Ondo State Government in 2009. Professor Ajay has published over 80 research publications, which are being referred to both locally and internationally. He is an erudite scholar. He has supervised and mentored over 150 undergraduate research projects. 31 master's degree research projects, seven PhD projects in core areas of corn surveying, ranging from procurement studies, contract administration, project management, and cost management. Professor Isaac Olani Yaje is a professor of quantity surveying at the Department of Quantity Surveying, Federal University of Technology, Akure, Ondo State. He is now ably represented by QS Ayodeji. So let's put our hands together for his discussion.
Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm here representing Professor I.C. Kajay, who is unavailably absent. Uh, currently, he's preparing for his inaugural lecture, and uh, he's also contesting to be the dean of our school, which is going to hold soon. So because of that, he's engaged in uh, so many things. That's why he's not here. Okay, so I'm uh, Dr. Ayodeji Oke by name, and uh, I'm going to be speaking on this uh, particular theme for today. But before I go into that, uh, standing on the existing protocol, I want to appreciate the NIQS Lagos State Chapter for the opportunity to stand before us this morning. And uh, I will not start the discussion until I also appreciate people who have actually made me what I am this particular day. Uh, you know, some years ago, I was an IT student at FAB Partnership. IT student, that's some years ago. And uh, today, I'm so happy to have uh, Mr. Adetola uh, in this gathering. Uh, I'm so excited. I remember the first time I was to present something at uh, QSRBN level. He was seated there and, uh, you know, I was shaking. I didn't know how to start. We actually encouraged like I should go on. And after the whole thing, he embraced me. So I'm so happy to see you once again, sir. Thank you for everything. Yes, uh, looking at the topic we have before us, talking about the issue of economic recovery and provision of sustainable infrastructure and mean security challenges in Nigeria, the roles of built environment professionals. Uh, I want to believe that justice has been done to issue of economic recovery. Uh, looking at the keynote speaker, he has uh, told us so many things about the economy of Nigeria. He has also told us uh, where we started from, where we are, what we need to do, talking about the economic issue. And then, of course, the question to us is what concerns us as uh, professionals in the construction industry. Because uh, everything I've said earlier is just too general. That's the same thing people in uh, management will say. The same thing people in banking sector, we, I mean, we talked about. Uh, yesterday, I was uh, listening to TVC, and the real estate developers were having maybe uh, a, a discussion like this, and uh, this is the same thing they were talking about as well. But I like the last part of the theme for today, which is more or less like the rules of built, I mean, of professionals in the built environment, which I want to believe that that is the key thing that we need to look into. In as much as uh, we are in this country together, whatever happen, happens to all of us, but the question is, what is my role? What is your What can we do as individuals, as professionals? Uh, I want to pick something from uh, the presentation of the keynote speaker. He was talking about the issue of abandoned projects. And he said that uh, as of 2019, it was estimated to about 230 billion naira. That's estimated federal government projects alone. That's talking about federal government uh, projects. Now, by the time we go to state projects, we can imagine the amount. Now go to private sector, we can imagine the amounts. Now go to individual sectors, we can imagine the amounts. And that is where we come in as quality surveyors, as built environment professionals. Yes, and they're looking at the issue of security as well. Uh, this has been a major challenge to us in Nigeria. Over time, uh, I work in Ondo State, and uh, from the time I started practicing there, uh, the Niger Delta area, you know, Ondo State is one of Niger Delta states, and the uh, the very first time I was to do a project close to Elijah area and the rest, and uh, we are on site. And all of a sudden, said they are, they are around, they are around. Who are they? Ah, we have to pay them. That's the ideal thing. So for them over there, uh, the best way to beat them, when you're having your foundation, you must set out a particular amount for them. When you're having, at every stage of the project, there's a particular amount for them. If you're bringing any material to site, even if it's just a bag of cement on a, on a bike, there is a particular amount you have to pay. So at a time, we have to decide on uh, how to go about it. You have to factor in that cost into our bill of quantity. You know, cost of, you know, like here now, we talked about bureaus, but over there, we talked about the militants. That's the issue of security. And now it has a... Uh... Okay. I was just giving 10 minutes. Well, initially, I was still 20 minutes, but it's fine. Uh, so that's the issue of security. And like I said earlier, we are not here to talk about economic issues and security issues. This is uh, things I want to believe all of us are familiar with. So let's look at it as uh, quality surveyors, as professionals in the built environment. What can we do? All these things are actually happening around us. 
And you know, uh, we cannot shy away from the fact that we belong to a very important uh, sector of the economy. Before now, we refer to it as a AEC sector, that's architecture, engineering, and construction sector. But of course, we have moved beyond that. Now it has to be AECO because uh, the issue of operation has to come in architecture, engineering, construction, and operation sector. And that's one of the issues we have been having before now. We have been focusing too much on the structure, too much on, uh, on the facility. Once it's standing, then we are fine. We are done with the project. No. In fact, that is where the issue of sustainability is coming in. Beyond the issue of the structure standing, beyond the fact that the structure is now functioning. What about the issue of operation, issue of maintenance, issue of reuse, issue of recycling? And in fact, after the pay has been completed, we want to look at so many other factors, so many other variables. And that is where we come in as the quantity surveyors. I remember the first paper I presented uh, during an IQS meeting was actually on uh, value management. And uh, I want to tell us that today, in this part of the world, we are still struggling to adapt some of these principles or to adopt them into our project. And these are management principles that has been used in other countries, and uh, it has actually benefited them in so many ways. I know then, I think uh, we actually did the research, and uh, it was only one project that uh, Van was applied in Nigeria, but today we have seen a lot of them, but yet we still believe that we can bring in more of this into our project. I'm already talking about our roles as quality surveyors, as built environment professionals. We need to start getting into some of these management tools. Uh, of course, we cannot continue to do things the same way and expect different results. But because we have been doing things the same way, we are getting the same results. If we want to talk about sustainable construction, then we need to change our approach, how we actually approach construction projects generally. You know, looking at the sustainable development goals, there are two major areas. Of course, every other areas are key to us. Talking about no poverty and the rest of them, uh, we are so important. But talking about the two major areas, that's the goal nine as well as goal 11. Goal nine actually talks about the issue of industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And that is why we come in. And uh, every other industries actually depend on this particular area. Then goal 11 talks about sustainable cities and communities. And that is where I actually want to dwell on as far as the, my discussion is concerned. Now, looking at the issue of sustainability, I'm sure this is not new to us. It's not strange to us. We have had this several times. But the question is, why is it that we are finding it difficult to adopt sustainable uh, development principles, even in our project? Why is it that clients are continuing to insist on what, I mean, what they've known to be the uh, uh, project success element? And you know, over time, Gone are the days where our project success indices revolves around cost time and quality. These days, it has actually shifted beyond that. Uh, I wouldn't know for some of us, uh, there is this uh, project in Scotland, in fact, the uh, parliament building. The, uh, the element of success for that project then was satisfaction of the lawmakers. In fact, the project, I think uh, it's uh, almost 100% uh, extra actually came from the project. That's cost overrun. But to them, that was not a factor. So that means for such a project, the issue was not about cost anyway. I mean, cost was not the main thing. The issue was not really also about the quality, if you looked at it. It's not also about time. It's about satisfaction. And that is what we are going. That's talking about the issue of sustainability. That means that some other project sources, indices, that we need to start looking into. For clients, exactly what does the client want? And that takes me back to the issue of value management, which I want us to be looking into as quantity surveyors. It's not just going to be enough for us to hear about all of these things, and we are not practicing them. We are not adopting them in our project. Because one of the things that management does is to ensure that we achieve best function at the lowest possible cost. And I know that is what we, I mean, that is what we do in, I mean, in construction as quantity surveyors. We are too concerned about cost. It's fine. But what VM is bringing up is that, yes, we can also dwell on cost, but at the same time, why are we not looking at the best function at the lowest possible? Because I will give us an example. For instance, you look at windows. There are so many types of windows. And for instance, looking at this place now, the windows here are not actually serving any purpose. Why? Because they are already covered. They are not serving any purpose of ventilation, lightning, or any of such. So that means it's not even important how expensive the window is. As far as the function is concerned, it's not serving any function that we know windows to serve. But yet, we still go ahead and make use of expensive windows. That's extra cost on, that, on such a project. Until we start coming up with such things and we start finding a way to remove those extra costs, we continue to incur costs on projects. 
And then, by the time we looked into this, then we also need to start looking at some digital tools in construction. Uh, I was there uh, somewhere, I was actually in Dubai some times ago, and that would be the first time I just saw some men, I saw them with some gadgets around them, and they easily they were lifting bags of cement and the rest. You know, I was amazed that like, these people must be so powerful. But you know, the tall guy was telling us that uh, we should look at their hands, that they're actually running some gadgets. So I have to ask, what is that? He said it's actually referred to as exoskeleton. And uh, what's exoskeleton? He said it's actually uh, a kind of gadget you can put around you and with it, it will just strengthen your muscle and the rest. You can carry a lot of things. No, that's to let us know that if it's in such countries, I'm sure it's also in most of the European countries, it's a matter of time, it will come to us as well. And the fact remains that we cannot talk about sustainable construction unless and expect we looked at digital tools. We are in the fourth industrial revolution. We have gone through the stone age. We have gone through the mechanization age, I mean age. We have gone through the internet age. Now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. As currently surveyors, we cannot shy away from the reality on ground. The reality is that in a matter of time, it's not going to be by paperwork. I remember at FOAB then, even as at that time, we're already talking about working towards the paperless office. And the reality is now on us that that paperless office has to be actualized. We have gotten to, a, to an age where people in forest are telling us, stop cutting trees, stop, I mean, cutting bamboos. You are destroying the forest. And for us, most times, what we make use of us is paper. So that means there's a need for us to reduce our paper. How do we do that? We have to go digital. And I want to just uh, talk about some of these uh, digital tools that we need to start looking into as currently surveyors that will actually help us, even as we uh, provide value for money for clients. Uh, one of them I'll be talking about is uh, Internet of Things. I know this is also becoming common. Uh, but it's not just for it to be common. The most important thing is for us embracing it and adopting all of these things, even in our projects. Internet of Things. I, I remember sometimes ago, you have to like uh, put people on site. Whenever they are casting concrete, engineers should be on site, consultants case has to be on site. We need to move beyond that, where we can actually have gadgets that monitor things for us on site. You know, we now live in a world where with our uh, smart uh, research, you can control what happens in your home, you can switch off your DSTV, you can switch up your, I mean, switch off your door, you can close your door, you want to somebody that is happening, just by tapping our wristwatches. So that means we can actually bring that into construction as well. Whereas we can monitor things that happen on all our sites, even without going there. Yes, we know that uh, in this part of the world, we still need to be there physically. What we are saying is as much as possible, we need to start embracing all of these things as well. Yes, then we talked about uh, various forms of reality. No, it started from augmented reality, it went to virtual reality, now we are talking about mixed reality. In fact, it has actually gone beyond that, we are now talking about digital twin. Whereas, it's not just enough for me to see the kind of being that I, that I want, but that I can actually do some simulation on the building. I know what will happen to the building in case some things happen, even before starting the building at all. You know, that's what we do in that feasibility study. Well, I just want to see if the building is possible, if it's viable, and the rest of them. But it has gone beyond the, just the paperwork. Now, you talked about simulation. For instance, I want to start uh, maybe a four or five story building. I want to see the effect of wind on that building. Even when the design is not on ground, I can actually do a, a digital twin of such a project and see how those forces, you know, will affect the building. So, seeing how those forces will affect it, that means if there's a need to redesign, then possibly put the structure this way then do a simulation again, see how those forces will affect the project again. By so doing, by the time we are done with all those simulations, we can be sure that we'll be coming up with uh, a project that will stand the test of time. And of course, another thing I would like to talk about, issue of gamification. You know, uh, for our children, uh, issue of games, different kind of games. But these days, people are now applying this gamification into different uh, industries. For instance, in the banking sector, it's more or less like you're actually playing games. And uh, I remember in uh, South Africa, that was uh, two years ago, someone actually did the research on uh, this gamification. That means you can actually repair a bill of quantity, more or less by playing a game. It's as if you are playing your, uh, I wouldn't know the game we play during our time, but maybe you are playing your lieutenant and they just you are playing your game. Now we need to start looking into that on how we can actually make uh, Currently surveying profession easier. Somebody can actually play a game and just, as if I'm playing a game and I'm seeing my building, I'm seeing how it's retreating, I'm seeing how I can actually situate my 
my couch, I can situate my bed. Like I know I don't want this color. You know, when you enter, you look at this color. No, just by playing a game. So we can also look into that as a quantity surveyors. Then we talked about the issue of cloud computing. I know some of us has been doing this, but we also need to take it to higher level. One of the days when we're talking about knowledge management is about the number of files that we have in our offices. You know, when you want to search for a particular project, you have to start looking for files, you know, in that order and the rest. But of course, since we have got to the area of digitalization, then the onus is on each and every one of us to also digitalize our knowledge management. You know, cloud computing, whereas everything can be done in the cloud. Anywhere we get to, we are already doing that with our phone. Anywhere we get to, we can actually access our document, maybe from Google Drive and the rest of them. So why can't we do the same thing for construction? Why must we always be on site until we monitor projects? Why must we always be in the office until, I mean, before we actually actualize some of our uh, target and objectives? So we need to go digitalize. Then we talked about the issue of big data, nanotechnology. There are so many of these principles. But of course, all of them revolves around the fourth industrial revolution principle. And uh, we are in that particular stage, we are in that particular era where, just like uh, the keynote speaker towards the end, we cannot deny the fact that we are in that era. Is that we, we key into it or we allow it to sweep us off? And I want to believe that the essence of this discussion is not for us to be swept off. It's for us to key into the discussion, in, into uh, the further evolution principle so that uh, in a few years to come, because it's a matter of time. You know, we started from uh, the Stone Age. Now we're in the fourth uh, revolution. It's a matter of time. We're going to go into the fifth revolution. And it's a matter of time as well. If the world still exists, we are going to go into the sixth revolution. It's a matter of time. Things will keep changing. So imagine if you are not uh, keen into what is happening. And what we have by the time we get to the fifth revolution. For instance, imagine our grandparents. Where the internet age was upon us then. Some of them did not know how to use internet. If you cannot use internet, there is no way you can key in even at this particular point in time. So we need to just key ourselves into all of these things. Then, another thing I have here is the issue about mimicry, which I, uh, I will want us to start looking into as quality surveyors. You know, we are looking at roles of built environment professionals when it comes to economic recovery, security challenges, and the rest. You no, know, there are so many of these principles that has actually been introduced over the years that we need to bring into the construction industry. You no, know, but is a principle that looks like that looks at nature. How is nature behaving? For instance, uh, we've been told and that we have heard that if you, for instance, as beautiful as this place is, just leave it, don't maintain it for about 10, 20 years. Before you know, nature will take over. Plant will start growing there. You understand? So can we also get to that point where construction projects will also take care of itself? And that takes us back, of course, to the principle I was referring to earlier. Sustainable construction, all of them revolve around it. So lastly, I want to say, for us, next time we are working on projects, or by the time we are working on our project, or the project we are working on, or the one we will work on subsequently, can we start looking at the issue of uh, not just construction, but issue of operation. Now, projects are meant to last a particular period. The question should be, what happens when that period elapses? This is a building, and uh, ideally, a building is meant to last for 60 years. The question in our mind should be, what happens after that 60 years? That's why we have a lot of abandoned projects, a lot of uh, unused projects around us. Why? Because some other things will come in, and uh, some new design will come in. We abandon the other ones. But if you go to UK and the rest of them, they have their category A projects. Projects that, as they were in 1940, the same in terms of a shape, design. Of course, they must have done a lot of restructuring inside. But you dare not tamper with, uh, what's it called, the appearance. So we need to get to that point where we start talking about the issue of uh, recycling. The materials we are using, are they recyclable? The uh, projects we are talking about, can they be reused when they actually expire? Even when they cannot be reused, the materials for such projects, can we actually break them down, use them for some other things? So that in future, we are not going to be having so many abandoned projects. So what can you do as individuals, as built environment professionals? We need to first and foremost, uh, get ourselves abreast with all of these things happening around us. Then the next thing is to suggest all of these things to our clients. Some of us are in key uh, positions where we can actually influence things. Value management was not adopted in the UK until some people stood up. And at a time, it became uh, a major tool for projects in the UK. Any project that must, be started, I mean, that must be done in the UK, as at that time, must be done through value management. In Germany now, 
any project that must be done what is a, above a particular amount, it has to go to sustainable development goal. It must be certified. They are, they are actually organizing a competition. Whereas, at the end of the year, they want to see which project actually have the highest score in terms of sustainability. So until we get to that point, I doubt we'll be able to influence things possible. So I want to charge us this particular day that as much as possible, let's influence our world positively and let's ensure that we develop and design and work on projects that are sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayodeji. Okay. Another round of applause for him, please. Honestly, I, I, I'm interested in the gadgets, gadget parts. Because I'm wondering how we're going to maybe tie on the gadget and still be able to ward off the insecurity. So maybe by the time the question and answer comes, you'll be able to elaborate more on it. Thank you so very much. I uh, want to recognize some people that are online. Uh, recognize the presence of QS Ayuba Akiri, the immediate past chairman of the Lagos chapter. Uh, QS Awa Audi, the Niger chapter chairman and waxing um, treasurer. She actually sent the message that I want to read. It said, I congratulate the flagship chapter for yet another distinguished lecture series. On behalf of the Senate and the entire members of Nigeria Institute of Conscious of Wales, Niger State Chapter, I wish you a successful hosting. Together, we shall take our profession to greater heights. Kudos to you all. Thank you, Kiyosawa. We appreciate your support. Uh, also recognizing the presence of the YQSF chairman, Kiyosayo Dili Faleye. Thank you for the support. Uh, we, we have some discussants online, and I'm sure you are wondering that one chair is uh, vacant. It's uh, uh, Mrs. Linda Onefile. She's supposed to be the immediate past chairperson of APB and Legal's chapter. She's supposed to be here, but she's um, indisposed. She called in sick yesterday, so we wish her a quick recovery. And um, so we'll go on. We have um, QS. Um, Bola Abisogun online. QS Bola Abisogun is based in the United Kingdom, but is joining us online this morning as a discussant. He's an independent uh, management consultant, chartered construction manager, and the chartered quantum surveyor and fellow of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. He's an eminent fellow of RICS. Bola is a Gemini ambassador on behalf of the Center for Digital Built Britain, CDBB, and recent a co-author of the Digital Twin Business Case Toolkit, published in joint partnership with Tech UK in February 2021. Bola is an industry disruptor, a serial curator, and innovative systems level architect delivering digital twin solutions using contact and protect platforms. He is an industry thought leader and specialist practitioner in the digital construction. He is a smart legal contract block, blockchain, built access assurance, BIM, as BIM, technical compliance, and whole life cycle asset management. Bola gained his first degree in quantum surveying and construction management, graduating in 1994 as the first black student to achieve a double first class with honors at the University of Wolverhampton. He serves as a non-executive director, trustee of the Charters of Yours Training Trust, and is a livery man of the worship company of Charters of Yours. During the last decade, Bola has created on both sides of the Atlantic an acute focus on digital transformation, and the digital skills required across the cost management profession via his industry initiative, PQS 2030. He remains an ambassador for and advisor to an array of Russell Group University, as well as the RICS APC assessment, where he continues to nurture the next generation of aspiring chartered surveyors to address the current and long-standing imbalance across the profession and with full corporate support from RICS. Bola established diversity surveyors in 2006 as the first RICS network of black, Asian, and minority ethnic BIM surveyors, launched formally at RICS headquarters in Parliament Square, London, during the October 2017. In recognition of his well-documented effort, Bola 
was awarded OBE, which is Order of the British Empire, a Queen Honours for services to diversity and to young people in the construction industry in the 2019 year's Honours list, published in December 2018. I introduce to us QA's Bola Abisogu, OBE FRCS, for his discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. An absolute pleasure. Um, I, I've been sitting here patiently for, for almost two hours enjoying every single minute. Um, Thank you, um, sir. I want to, um, just commend everybody, the distinguished guests, um, the entire leadership team of NIQS. Um, special thanks to Annette okay, for introducing me to this uh, opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Um, too many names to mention. Um, also, a special mention to my dear colleague, Hakeem Smith. Uh, unfortunately, my brother, I'm not in Lagos, so we can't enjoy some suya this afternoon, but uh, I'm pretty sure moving forward, we'll be able to uh, capitalize on that opportunity. But it's been a pleasure so far. Uh, now, what can I say? I've heard so much. Um, I feel like I'm at home already. So uh, I feel privileged and humbled to be here. And that is why, fortuitously, for, for me, everything I've heard so far will build into my short 10, 15 minute sharing with you. So, as, as our dear uh, colleague has advised, I'm Paul Abisogun OBE. I'm a chartered quantity surveyor. Um, I'm frustrated in many ways, and that's why I'm a disruptor, as God would have it. Um, but I want to start with a thing that has been touched on by our keynote, our previous speaker. And I'm going to delve into a little bit more detail around the potential for Nigeria and, and the opportunities that I see as a diaspora based in London, looking into Nigeria. So I will start with um, the theme of today. And I have to admit, when I received the letter gratefully from NIQS with the theme that talked about the economic recovery and the provision of sustainable infrastructure amidst security challenges. I was, I was thinking, how on earth do I relate that concept, that, that narrative to the humble role, albeit impactful, of the quantity surveyor? So the reference to the role of professionals, I'm going to focus on the role of the professionals and actually what I think could and should be happening um, over the next 5, 10, 20 years, as far as Nigeria is concerned. So this was the narrative behind uh, my, my request. Um, and I hope you can see my screen for those that are observing both in person and online. Um, the, the issue of what is going on across the world is, is, is a given. We can't control much of what is happening. Um, do we need to run for help? No, I don't think so. I think we need to look within. And uh, our keynote, um, Professor Andrew, made mention to um, the reason why we need to look closer to home rather than further afield. However, the, 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 the highlighted red statement for Nigeria, this is a multi-layered quandary, a health crisis, a near total shutdown of economic activities. Uh, capital reversal, security challenges, and a fast increasing unemployment rate fueled by layoffs in almost every aspect of the economy. That to me was powerful. My only response to that challenge statement was, wow. And I'm still in shock and awe at the scale of the challenge, but I'm optimistic and I'll tell you why I'm optimistic. So again, I'm going to focus on the role of the professional and contextualize that regarding the PQS given that this is an NIQS discussion. Um, so there are a number of things we can't control. Social ills, the PQS is not immune. Regarding the procurement and delivery of projects, past speakers have mentioned the challenges associated with procuring projects. So we can't control many factors, inflation, theft, dishonesty, ethical behaviors, um, price, time, quality in many ways. Of the choices left, to the command of the PQS. Much is still influenced by others, even the client. But that is where the opportunity exists because with particular regard to the client and key stakeholders, whether they be banks, high net worth individuals, funding bodies, 
the PQS is well placed to advise and educate. And I think historically, we as quantity surveyors haven't done that well. We haven't shared knowledge very well. We haven't shared data very well. We're still very competitive around some of those core business drivers, but do we need to be in 2021? Can we afford to be moving forward? So what is the relationship between the PQS and the provision of sustainable infrastructure across Nigeria? This is designed to be provocative. So I hope I upset a few people as I progress through my slides. So when we talk about sustainable infrastructure, what exactly are we talking about? You know, what is it? Roads, bridges, rail, power, telecoms, logistics, cybersecurity. What are we talking about? How do we define it globally? Not necessarily on African soil, on, in particular in Nigeria. How do we define sustainable infrastructure? My view is sustainable systems designed to meet essential services. How do we define essential services? I'll touch on that later. As quantity surveyors, we need to ask ourselves, how can we measure and accrue more value from infrastructure assets? How can we do that? How do we do it at the moment? Do we do it at all? How many different ways are we doing it? How many different ways are our clients receiving that advice? Again, Dr. Andrew touched on this point, a point that is very close to my heart and will unlock that dead capital that was referred to earlier. How do we de-risk Nigeria to entice, incentivize, and grow foreign direct investment? How do we do that as quantity surveyors? What is our role in making Nigeria a better place to invest? What is the role of technology in achieving and scaling the above? You know, I didn't come here to present. I came here to have a conversation, a very serious conversation that frustrates me as a fellow Nigerian outside looking into my father's land. So in fact, what is the role of the PQS in relation to all of the above? That's the question that we really need to be discussing today. And it's a question that I've challenged myself. I've challenged my own profession in the UK on the very same issues. So currently, and on the back of the global pandemic, everybody across the world is talking about build back better. Is Nigeria talking about building back better? And if he or she is, what is her definition of building back better? Again, an array of questions. Number one, and again, it was touched on earlier by our keynote speaker. In fact, my previous speaker also mentioned this in part. Where are we as a profession, as built environment professionals, where are we on data, structure, cleanliness, provenance, design, standards, methods, engineering, standards, methods, construction, standards, methods, where are we? Where is Nigeria? I give you one. I saw 19650 and I'll say no more. I hope you all Take the slides, I've shared the slides with our ICS Nigeria group on WhatsApp, so you can have a copy of these slides to further, as an aide more than anything else. But the point is, that is a standard, an international standard that I think should be at the core of everything Nigeria is doing. And us as quantity surveying practitioners should be aware of what it means to us and our role moving forward. How far has the built environment profession innovated itself? since independence, what have we done? What is materially different today in 2021 that didn't exist in the 60s, apart from the presence of technology? How has the role of the quantity surveyor changed in over 60 years? Question. Yet in 2021, I believe we are looking at a perfect storm, perfect opportunity to disrupt, dismantle, and unlearn. And what do I mean by that? I mean, let us take what we do and have done. Let's turn it upside down. Let's shake the bag, turn the bag the right way up, 
I begin to fill it with new ideas, new processes, new standards. This is the opportunity. This is what the COVID pandemic inadvertently, but fortuitously has presented the gift to Nigeria. We talk about disruption. I talk about disruption. I'm, I'm asking you now because I'm talking to many of my, uh, my, my younger cohort, next gen leaders. Most of them are in the white QS. I heard QS. I had LA is on the call. He's a young man that I'm talking to very closely, as is Alayyad and Usman. Both of those young practitioners are talking to me frequently about disruption, about changing the profession about achieving sustainable infrastructure, about achieving net zero, because if we don't, Dr. Andrew has told us, 10 to 25% of the population of Lagos may be underwater. Carbon reduction, how efficient are our assets? Economic, social, and the environmental goals, ESG, governance, how effectively are we aware and enlightening our clients? What is the role of the quantity survey in that demand? And it's huge and growing. I would even say much of the capital that will arrive, not may, will arrive in Nigeria, will be looking for ESG type, SDG driven opportunities as a matter of course. So how? Have we future-proofed the design, the build, and the maintenance of our critical and essential infrastructure? How have we done that to date? And how are we doing it moving forward? Have we future-proofed anything that we're building in Nigeria? Economic life, whole life, asset cycle, 10, 25, 30 years. How are we measuring the assurance and optimization of those assets, road, rail, housing, retail, commercial, logistics? Are we measuring? Have we future proof? What is the failure rate of our construction process? So do we have, and does there exist a healthy asset maintenance culture in Nigeria? It's a question. My view, there isn't one. Again, that means it's an opportunity to get it right now. So let us focus on some of the key issues and financial blockers. Pressures and priorities, I call them. Building safety, including health and safety, generally, not only on site, public realm. Decarbonization of existing assets across Nigeria, specifically in Lagos. Extensive repair and renewal. Dare I even say it, retrofit. Retrofit, really? Is that necessary? Can we afford to do it in Nigeria? Asset management. We need to be predictive in our asset management, but can we be? And at the core, at the root of our challenge, it's not money, it's not even technology, it's our people. The experience and the skills of our professionals, of our general population, of our clients, all those words in red relate to cultural challenges. They're all affected by cultural nuances and behaviors. That is part of our challenge moving forward. So again, kindly referenced earlier on by our co-host, much of the work I've been doing for the five, five, maybe 10 years now has been in the digital space and in particular digital twins. But what on earth is a digital twin? Again, these slides are in your possession, hopefully, or will be before the end of the day. What is a digital twin? It was referenced earlier on, thankfully. So this is just a slide to articulate exactly what it means and what it means for Nigeria, because this is the business case or rather use case in the UK that I've been working on with the UK government. It's called the National Digital Twin, a joint venture between the University of Cambridge and BASE, which is a government department. But fundamentally, there are four elements to a twin. Physical, an asset system or process. Data, big data, again, mentioned previously. We need to bring that in, clean it, structure it, use it in the digital twin, which is a data storage vehicle. I call it the black box. And then there are interventions. Previous speaker mentioned developing a scheme virtually before we build it physically. That's the essence of a digital twin. But once we build the asset physically and we commission that asset and we switch it on, those data loops need to inform 
each other about what the asset is doing. But essentially, that's the concept of a digital twin. So in 1994, as God would have it, I wrote my thesis. And my thesis spoke about computer-ready claims management. What I was thinking then was a process-level digital twin that talked about dispute resolution using structured data. I won't bore you with the details of how the system worked and why they gave me a first, but it embraced artificial intelligence, machine learning, expert systems. In fact, building information modeling, which to me is better information management, relational databases and standards forms contract. And what I did was come up with an idea that said that the client would be better positioned and informed on the decision to press go, no go on a dispute. That was in 1994. Today, 2021, I'd like to do something very similar for Nigeria, not just leaders. Andrew mentioned it again. We need a, we need a Nigerian effort, a Nigerian strategy that will benefit Lagos as well as all the other areas. Currently on the left, our data looks like the blue. It's a mass of unstructured data flying all over the place. What we need to achieve is the box on the right, structured data. So as I've said there, our relationship, our relationship as quantity surveyors, as cost managers with data needs to evolve from unstructured to structured and it needs to be shared. Again, a cultural behavior we need to address. So my digital twin vision for Nigeria looks like this, but is it possible to achieve that by 2030? We're talking about transport, connecting with the rest of the world, retail, education, people, housing. In fact, any asset, residential, commercial, retail, above and below ground, dare I say, assets. Power, that's the elephant in the room. Government, local, state, central. And of course, that will provide the engine for the digital twin. Will it be 2050? That's a question, but that's our challenge. That's where we are. That's the opportunity. That's the gift and our role as quantity surveyors is growing. This is the current perspective from my colleagues at RICS. I do a lot of work with the RICS. This is the current perspective on my initiative called PQS 2030. This is the, the, the interpretation of what we need to do better, cost prediction, encompassing and estimating cost planning, benchmarking projects for life, cycle, not just the construction phase, the entire life cycle. We need to get it right before we start building for every asset type. And fortuitously for all of us, as God would have it, today, 1st of July, is the launch of the professional statement, mandatory professional statement, meaning every qualified quantity surveyor on the planet has to comply with the new cost prediction professional statement from today, 1st of July. Another reason why I was keen to attend, and I wrote a piece earlier this week, that's the link, you can take a read. I've had some phenomenal feedback from all kinds of people, central government, local government, ministers, thinking, Bola, is this real? I said, yes. I now refer to myself as a strategic advisor because the role of the quantity surveyor will be referred to in the future as the digital cost manager. Again, the digital twin toolkit that I have co-authored with a number of great people. I've worked with some of the best minds, as you can see. Some of the best minds in the UK worked on that document. It's in every government department and moving across the world. I want central government in Nigeria to be aware of what this toolkit can do for Nigeria, to unlock dead capital using Dr. Andrew's statement earlier on. This is an opportunity we have to capitalize on as quantity surveyors, if you choose to call yourself a quantity surveyor, because you are now moving into cost management, whether you like it or not. So I'll end by painting a picture of the cost benefits of using structured data that is shared, not only in the context of digital twins, but shared generally to capacity build all of us as professionals and to better advise our clients and other stakeholders. And I will tell you, I'm having a conversation at the moment with two banks. I've mandated two things, mandated two things first, as they commission and fund projects, they must demand, written into the contract, that 
a commissioned and connectable digital twin is a deliverable from the project. And to that end, this statement talks about the value proposition. So in the UK, for every one pound that you invest in structured information management, it can generate anything between five and six pounds as an outturn cost benefit. And for productivity gains, that will increase by a further 20, 40%. This is not hypothesis, this is fact. I spent the last two years of my life, God willing, in this space. And it took the presence of the pandemic in March, 2020 to unlock this conversation nationally in the United Kingdom, which is why I've been working very, very closely on the National Digital Twin and why they refer to me as a Gemini ambassador. My challenge is to inspire everybody in Nigeria, dare I say it, across the continent, to understand the scale of this opportunity and that no one can deliver this in isolation of anybody else. It's a team effort and there is no I in team. Those are my details. Feel free to, to connect, share, and like I said, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So Madam Speaker, I'll leave it there. Thank you. The round of applause for him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, um, thank you so much, um, Kiwezbola Bisogun. Um, I'm hearing gadgets in construction. I'm hearing internet infrastructure, cloud computing, digital data. I hope we have our questions so that we'll be able to do justice to this theme for this year. Um, on precedent and um, situation at times we require us to do unusual things. So you, we have to take one online and uh, one on-site um, discussant. And we have one of our sponsors. We want to recognize um, and appreciate uh, most of our sponsor. We can see some of them at the back of the, we have QS Farm FOAB partnership, the Frank partnership, Coste Consultant, Vicanto. We have ITB Nigeria Limited. We have Dulux. We have VACC Technical, Ledger Roofing, Julius Berger, and Lambert. We appreciate every one of you. And Dulux actually has a presentation which they will do after Engineer Abdul. We recognize the online presence of the Vice President of the Nigeria Institute of Contents of York, QS Kenen Zikwe, and uh, QS Femi Balogun, the CEO of QS Academy, and QS Theo Egu, the Secretary of International Affairs. We thank you for your support. We acknowledge the message sent by the Deputy President, Kiwe Zolayemi Shonubi, is not here with us physically, but he's online, lending his support to the program. So we go on to the discussant now, which is engineer Olayinka Abdo. She is a chartered and registered engineer with the Nigerian Society of Engineers, NCE, and the Council of Regulation of Engineering Practice in Nigeria, Koren. She's an associate member of the Nigerian Institute of Management. She holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the prestigious University of Ibadan, Southwest Nigeria, a master's in business administration from Lado Kiakintola University of Technology, Lautech, Obumosho. She also has a master's degree in project management from the University of Liverpool, United Kingdom. She's a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, member board of trustees of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, fellow Nigeria Institution of Civil Engineers. She is the past president of the Association of Professional Women Engineers, APWIN, and the registered member of the Society of Women Engineers, USA, and International Network of Women Scientists and Engineers. She began her career as a civil engineer, working as an inspector with Reed Crowder International 
under the Lagos State World Bank Assisted Water Project. She had a brief stint at Lands Consult Lagos and was responsible for designing and supervision of structural members and buildings before joining the Lagos State Development and Property Corporation, LSDPC, in 2000 as a senior engineer. She rose through the ranks and became the head of civil structure in LSDPC before she was redeployed to the Lagos State Public Works Corporation, LSPWC, as Director of Civil Engineering in June 2019. She is a versatile and experienced civil engineer and a project manager. And I'll say, if you want your road to be, to be worked on in Lagos, please hold on to her skirt as she's going. She's working hand in hand with the Lagos State Governor, Mr. Sonwoli, to give us good roads in Lagos. Thank you very much. Welcome, Engineer Mrs. Olayinka Abdo. Good afternoon, professional colleagues. I would like to stand on existing protocols. As earlier been introduced, my name is Olayin Kabdu. When I got the invite to present um, at this um, inaugural lecture, the first reaction was to decline because of my schedule. But um, the person that invited me, about 10 or 12 years ago, I did something wrong to her. And uh, three years later, she reminded me what I did. So I said, if I didn't answer this woman, she would take it personal again against me. So God help me so that I'm able to make today. And I'm very delighted to be here present um, among uh, the QS and I I presume there are some other professionals here present. It's a great honor and a great privilege. I'm not taking it for granted. Now, what is our story? Built environment, as we all know, consists of several multidisciplinary professions with a common basis of consulting, designing, constructing, operating, and maintenance. And all professionals related to the built environment has been counter challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which ravaged the world, and uh, the peculiar security gap existing in our country, Nigeria. It is therefore without gain saying that post-COVID-19 economic recovery would create greater challenge, challenges for provision of infrastructures that can be sustainable afterwards. Now, in Nigeria especially, the effect of the COVID-19 is projected to become more apparent in the next five to 10 years with serious infrastructural challenges. Now, what we've suffered for like a year is going to grow and produce children. And uh, by the time we start seeing the very well effect of it, it's not going to be next year, two years, but it's going to take longer. And coupled with the security challenges that we have now, now we've started suffering one or two things, as it were, food insecurity. A lot of us buy bags of rice that is more of a stable meal for exor exorbitant um, amount of uh, prices. Gary seems to be an onyibo man's food now because people in Nigeria can't even feed well on gari. And I remember growing up, gari is like a snack. You pick anywhere, anyhow. But now you discover that most mothers, they lock their gari now in their cupboard. Why? So it's no longer cheap. It's affecting the economy and the pulse of people. So the insecurity that we are suffering now, coupled with the pandemic that has happened last year, which we are still cleaning up the mess now, is going to have a very long effect with us. And how, how are we taking it? Are we actually paying the right attention to it? I doubt it. But I hope time will tell and we'll learn fast and quick. If we put in the current situation, which is an epidemic of huge dimension now, the security issues vis-a-vis -vis kidnapping, banditry, robbery, insurrection, and downright disregard 
for the root of law. The country is almost in a state of anarchy. Furthermore, is the, relentless, the restlessness of the youth that consists well over 30% of our population due to the unemployment and unavailability of opportunities has created a very daunting environment for professionals in the built industry to operate and to excel. How many young people sincerely want to work? A lot of us in our mid 40s, 50s that are engaging even interns now, how many of them will come to your office and will sincerely want to learn? It's either they are plugging something in their hair, they are on um, Twitter, they are Facebooking, they are, there are so many distractions. Unlike when I was growing up, you can start, stand or sit by drawing table, nothing to distract you. So is it that you learn how to draw, how to design well, or you just stay put there? But now, I'm sure you, a, lot of, a lot of people that even have phone calls, um, phones in their homes, their dad will probably hang it uh, maybe one or two meters high, and uh, for you to dial it, you'd probably climb a stool, you know, to make calls. But a three-year-old now has a phone. And um, if you have a five-year-old, you might be so surprised. The child might know a lot of operating things on your phone than you that you work to buy the phone. And you wonder, is it that you are not brilliant? What actually went wrong? Nobody actually taught the child, per se. But you discover that there are so many operating programs on the phone, as complicated as it were, that a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a 10-year-old, in fact, it's fantastic for a 13-year-old. They will use it more than you can, do, you can ever imagine. So things, narratives are changing. Things are changing. So as built professionals, I believe that we need to change our orientation. We need to change our concept. We need to change in a lot of things, in a lot of ways as, as which we perceive things now. As a people, we need to redirect our energy and refocus ourselves in line with the global standards and best practice. The world leaders through the United Nations has developed 17 global goals called Sustainable Development Goals, which as a people we can use to streamline our thoughts and actions. Particularly, I find three very interesting to the built environment. And these are goals eight, nine, and 11 which is the decent work and economic growth, the industry, the innovation, and the infrastructure, and sustainable cities and communities. This, in my thoughts, directly affect us. So we can't, as a group, now I'm not talking now as just a unit in the building industry. I'm talking a collaboration between the, see, each, individual members of the built industry. It's high time we stop doing things in silos. We come together as, um, as a cell to work out things for our future. We, we, we've looked at things individually for a very long time. How, what has it earned us? How has it affected us as a group positively? Have we really been able to have a lot of gains doing that? I think if we sincerely analyze reviewing our data, it's high time we come and form collaborations to break that ceiling as it is. The built, the built environment, like I said, could use these three goals to build the required change and growth. Now, economic recovery. The Nigerian economic prior and post-COVID has been receding due to the mono income structure derived from crude oil sales and substantial import bills. The economy has also been ravaged by various internal security crises like Boko Haram, Edsman, Banditry, Miem, which has created a diversion of scared resources to comfort this security issue. People pay ransom, as we know. 
It therefore follows that the opportunity cost of so many social services that government should provide is being diverted to contain these security issues and the global pandemic. So what does that leave us? We keep saying we don't have enough. Now we are paying ransom to people to stay afloat. The infrastructures that we're supposed to be building, we are jettisoning it as it is. How do we relate to that? Do we have any further plans to abridge all that so that five, six years to come, the gap won't be so wide? Now, a lot of people that are being paid for the kidnapping, the banditry, it's not as if they are keeping the money back in our system. We don't, we believe they are using it for ammunition. They, they can be using it for a thousand and one things. But is it affecting our infrastructures in Nigeria positively? No, I don't think so. So the narrative, again, we have to reconsider and change it. It is thankful that agriculture is now being prioritized as an engine of growth for the Nigerian economy. And hopefully, we're going to be having new dams, irrigation network, construction sites. In those lines, and related services will be required from professionals in the build industry. As the economy expands, it is hoped that the infrastructures will also expand, especially the railway network, various road construction maintain and maintenances, waterways, boats and ship, e.g., the Lagos Ibadan return train service, the expansion to Kano, and the contemplated southwest south south highways. This would cons constitute various opportunities and challenges to professionals in the build industry. The challenges of designing, constructing, and operating the various infrastructures required from a, reco a recovering economy presents huge opportunities and challenges, especially the worrisome trend of kidnapping, expatriates, consultants, working in various projects in different parts of the world. About three or four years ago, we, I was at a um, lecture like this, and um, we have um, two, two essays from Bruno State. One came in to give um, one of the lectures. And um, she was basically like requesting people, that they needed people to come to work for them. And uh, trust long truths like me. I first did like this. I said I will go. When I got home, I spoke to my husband and I spoke to some of my colleagues. They said, are you sure you are in your right senses? What are you going to do there? I said, ah, is it not to work? They said, if they had people in their midst that are citizens that can work, would they come and ask openly like that? And I had to, you know, I felt I was seriously being discouraged. So I placed a call back to the lady and I told her one on one. By the time I finished chatting up with her, even for her to go to sites to inspect projects, the battalions that needed to go with them. Now, and I look at, you are, you are rebuilding classrooms. You want to give your community roads. You are spending so much money to protect maybe five, 10 people. Is it by force? And um, you are not even sure all these projects are being done well. Because we, we still, Yes, we are talking digital twin, we are talking digital days, we are, but we still don't even have sustainable electricity even in Nigeria. In the north, we can't boast of wind energy. We can't boast of solar. In the west, in Lagos, we can't say we can tap light from the sea. Or you're the, south, the southwest, we can't say they can install wind turbines 
in some of our rural areas to, get, to give us light. So when you look at the level of insecurity that is actually prevalent in this country, we are lucky, we are here, we are in Lagos. It's not the same. Things is degrading and is degrading rapidly. Is degrading rapidly. Um, the doctor said something when he was making his presentation about the riverine areas in um, in uh, Undo State for them to work. A project that is supposed to cost a naira in any other state in the southwest because of the peculiarity of insecurity that is ravaging as an epidemic in the uh, region, it will cost A plus B plus C plus D plus D, maybe almost to you. Who is accounting for that? Are we, are we having the discussion, even with these people, to let them see the gross injustice that they are doing? Thank you. So, the cost of ex ex executing projects in the northeast, northwest is really high. And professionals don't even want to go to those zones to work. Professionals in the building industry are particularly exposed to various construction problems. Now, the rule of safety first must be given serious attention and consideration. There must be security details attached to protect personnel's equipment and data, even on all project sites. Now, what is the future? The ideal situation requires professional in the built environment should be focused and engage in the use of technology in driving out the, uh, the activities and in carrying it out. We've seen how COVID has helped us to be more interactive, the use of web, um, web, webinars, virtual meetings, and which we've done very well. We have dead, we have been dead, and we must continue to think outside the box, to act differently, to achieve unimaginable exploits open to us. The construction of critical infrastructures like the Nightingale Hospital for the COVID-19 center in the UK was done within two, three weeks at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. This was a great testimony for all professionals in the built industry. What we can do if we are challenged by situation, we can actually think out of the box to achieve greater things. And I believe in Nigeria, we should, as professional entities in the building industry, begin to look at doing this. Now, we can begin to do smart houses, use recyclable materials. In public works, we've been trying the use of rubber tires, plastic, in Pilex to mix with our asphalt to get to have a more reusable materials. Concrete can be crushed and be reused. We can use warm and mixed asphalt to help reduce pollution so that our ecosystem will not be adversely affected. Now, I want to conclude by playing that building institutional capacity through our various professional bodies can help to teach and invent and innovate in our research and development. Like I said earlier, we don't have to fly solo. We can come, power with institution, bridging the, the gap between the town and the gowns, and getting corporate bodies to finance all these projects, the researches, so that as research is going on, we as professionals, we begin to put them to use in our different professions. And um, I believe that if as a body, a professional body, we begin to look at that, the corporate world is going to be easier for them. They will hold us responsible. And we can have a target 
updates as we are as the researchers the universities we keep them giving them things on topical issues try this material for us research on this for us research on this for us they are giving us the results we are trying them and we are getting back to the industries this is our result you've you funded us through and we are passing this money to the universities and other research institutes and this is what we can see and I believe if we start that, there's going to be a remarkable progress. The journey is not going to be in a day, but gradually we will get there. And in conclusion, we should build ourselves a strong force to build up ideas based on experiences gathered to our policies, to building sustainable infrastructures that can stand the test of time. Our integrity must be upheld at all times in our practice and decision taking. Compromises can only make us weaker and unstable. And according to Carl Jung, we cannot change anything unless we accept it. Hence, we must, as professionals in the built industry, accept to change to a positive part of economic recovery and providing sustainable infrastructure with our expertise for, our, for ourselves and future. Let us go instead where there is no path and let us leave a trail behind. Thank you. Another round of applause for her. When she started mentioning Gary, I was like, wow. From QS to engineering to Gary now, what is this? But I like the way she linked everything together. Now I'm hearing research. I've been hearing gadgets in construction, cloud computing, digital research now has entered. Then the main reason why we're here, our roles as professionals in this um, economic recovery and provision of sustainable infrastructure. Thank you so very much, Engineer Olai Nkabdo. Well, we are moving gradually to uh, question and answers, and I'll crave our indulgence that if you have questions, to make it fast for us so that we don't start passing the microphone around and much time is taken. You can write it down and pass through to the ushers. They are standing at the extreme end, can just signify, they'll collect it and bring it to the front so that it's fast for us. We still have one of our discussants online waiting, but before she comes up, um, Professor Abimbo Lamwida, but before she comes up, Dulux, one of our sponsor, has a presentation of about five minutes. We are giving them five minutes to make their presentation. Dulux paints. And also, we recognize the sponsorship of Quantec and BAM Associates. Thank you very much for supporting uh, this event. Thank you very much for always being there. And we are giving uh, special recognition to Kiweza Nate Oke. She's in the diaspora, but the work that she has done concerning this event is as if she's present here with us. Thank you very, very much for all that you do. God bless you. Good luck to you. Mr. President, Nigerian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, all existing protocols duly observed. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omotunde Bamigbaye, a representative of Dulux, a subsidiary of CAPPLC. I'm the brand manager, Dulux. Together with me today are our color consultants in the house and our brand executive. We're glad to be a part of your event today. And we say a big thank you to the organizers of this event for inviting us to partner with you and to give us an opportunity to educate you about Dulux. So who are we? We are the color experts. We have a wide range of colors in Dulux, and we have high-performing brands. 
We have brands with really strong equity and very strong consumer perception. We have Dulux Trade and Dulux Regular. Our paint types are decorative paints, surface preparation paints, and specialty products. Of recent, we have rationalized our portfolio and prioritized and moved the surface preparation product into the Caplox range. We have a pan-Nigeria coverage in North, East, West, Lagos, and South South. Our strength lies in our collaborative marketing model. So we have color centers across Nigeria, and at our color centers, you would experience a great customer experience with limited opportunities in color. We also have innovative products, and in particular, a tinting technology service, which allows you to get any color in just a few minutes across our color centers. We also offer free color and decor consultancy services, which is a value add whenever you visit our color center. These free decor and color consultancy services can also be reached through our social media platforms by connecting with us on our social media page and reaching out to us through the e-commerce platform, you can actually book a color consultancy service with us. And guess what? It's free. It's free. We're going to offer it to you free from Dulux. We also run empowerment programs across Nigeria. We have the Artisans Knowledge and Skill Acquisition programs, where we also give um, knowledge training and ensure that we produce certified painters across Nigeria. We do this through a pan-Nigeria approach. Now, why choose Dulux? We encourage you to choose Dulux because we have a rich brand heritage. We are a superior paint brand with over 63 years of experience. Our brand offers you superior quality and coverage and also superior durability. We are the most considered paint brand. We are the most recommended paint brand. And we're proud to say that we have a highly positive customer perception. Our products are also environmentally friendly. We have products that contain less volatile organic compounds and very friendly to the environment. Our proposition in summary is that Gilux offers you great value for your money. Our emulsion paint has a 15 to 17 square meter per liter coverage versus 10, 10 square meter per coverage for a regular standard matte paint. And our Dulux Silk has up to 18 square meter per liter coverage versus 12 square meter per liter coverage of a conventional silk paint. Dulux also offers you eye opacity, which means it has a very high hiding power. It's long lasting and durable, and it's great value for your money, eventually in terms of our price per square meter. So with Dulux, in summary, you can do more with less. If you open to the first page of your brochure, can we all do that, please? You would find our product advert there. Do more with less means that with Dulux, you can cover more with less quantity. That's the key message there. So it's a superior paint versus a conventional type of paint, either in emulsion or in silk variety. Now let's quickly, quickly through a journey of our types of paints. We have the Deluxe Trade Vinyl Silk. It's long lasting beauty for all paint interiors. It's a high quality silk emulsion, ideal for interior walls and ceilings. It's water-based with a mid sheen vinyl emulsion. It's available in over 12,000 colors, and it has a square meter per liter coverage of 16. We also have Deluxe Trade Weather Shield Smooth Mansory. It's an exterior wall protection that lasts up to 15 years. It's smooth, long-lasting finish for exterior masonry. It has excellent opacity and has a square meter per liter coverage of 16. And then the Deluxe Matte Emulsion is high quality durable for all interior and exterior surfaces. 
It provides superior durability, and it gives an even matte coating on concrete blocks, cement, softboard, asbestos, surface, and brickworks. And then the silk emulsion equally offers excellent coverage and great value for money, with a coverage of up to 18 meters square per liter. It's water-based, and it's a washable satin finish. The Deluxe Regular Weather Shield Textured is extremely tough and prevents airline cracks from reappearing. Deluxe Weather Shield Smooth Textured Regular, it's also extremely tough. It bridges airline cracks and prevents them from reappearing. It's a smooth masonry paint that provides an even smooth texture. And now the Weather Shield Textured Mats, it's a quality textured masonry that provides a fine pattern. So how can you reach us? You can reach us through connecting with us on our social media page at Deluxe Nigeria. You can reach us on WhatsApp at 081-5949-3070. Also follow us on all social media pages at Deluxe Nigeria, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also reach us at our care line directly and all game outlets. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you very much, Dulux, our lead, one of our lead sponsors. So as you have hit there, if you actually want to do more with less, you go for Dulux. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> All right, moving on. We are still at the 13th Annual Distinguished Lecture Series, and we've had about... The keynote speaker's address, we've had three other lectures. Now we're going to take the final uh, discussion for the day, and that is going to be from one of our discussants, who is going to also be online. She is in the person of Professor Abimbola Windapo. She is a professor of construction management. Professor Abimbola Windapo is a professor at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. She has more than three decades years of experience in practice, teaching and research in the construction industry. She was a lecturer to some of us here at the Department of Building at the University of Lagos. Also, she is a C2 rated researcher with the Nigerian Research Foundation and a professional construction project manager. She is registered with uh, many relevant professional bodies, and she is also a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Building. Her research work is interdisciplinary and focuses on construction industry development, construction business, and project management, infrastructure delivery management, practices and performance. She is the University of Cape Town spoke contact for the ARUA Center for Unemployment and Skills Development and the Urbanization and Habitable Cities in Africa. Let's welcome online Professor Abimbola Windakwa. Oh, that warm introduction. And uh, I want to say good afternoon for, to the chairman and members of the Lagos State Chapter of the Nigerian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, and the keynote speaker, fellow discussants, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I bring you warm greetings from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And I want to first of all thank the organizers of the NIQS Distinguished Lecture Series for counting me worthy of being invited to today's event as a panel discussant. It's been a worthwhile afternoon, although I'll have to leave soon. I have a lecture at three o'clock. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today to discuss the theme, economic recovery and provision of sustainable infrastructure amidst security challenges in Nigeria the role of the professionals. The presentation made by Dr. Nevin 
on the top 10 themes for the Nigerian economy in 2021, and other previous speakers resonates with me, especially regarding the state of the Nigerian economy, security challenges, the reasons why we are where we are as a nation, and ways through which the professionals in the built environment can help the country in its quest for economic recovery and in the provision of sustainable infrastructure. The first one is that Nigeria must find its own development, as stated by uh, Dr. Nevin, and I agree very much with that statement. The world has become a global village with open borders. A globalized world has created a class where foreign services and goods are dumped in the Nigerian market. Nigeria cannot catch up with the level of development and is many steps behind the so-called developed countries. But if we use the sustainable sustainability index, Nigeria is a sustainably developed country as per the keynote speaker. While they are at the fourth industrial revolution with the digital revolution, we haven't even yet started on the second producing steady electricity supply, manufacturing internal combustion engines, or producing ICTS and electronic goods. I agree, we may need to leapfrog into the future with innovations that address our own local challenges. We must find our own development. Also, globalization has brought about the availability of more commercialized and politicized research systems and education, which we have to be careful about. In the global world, this includes the developments of fields and techniques that we have not even imagined a quarter of a century ago. And I listened when previous speakers talked about the telephone or communication systems used just 25 years ago currently to what three-year-olds use today. However, all this globalization may lead to privatization of knowledge and the limited research for the public goods in the country. And we've seen how the patent for the COVID-19 vaccines is being privatized and it's not being openly shared across the global landscape. So we start producing students and practitioners who have nothing to show for what they have learned in school. What they have learned is already dated by the time they graduate. So I'll now react briefly to some of the top themes identified by Dr. Nevin as shaping the Nigerian economy in 2021. The un unlocking debt assets shows us that the housing deficit creates a huge opportunity for investment, development, and growth in the country. And harnessing the power of the diaspora shows that the country's biggest export is its human capital, and Nigeria stands a lot to gain from harnessing this power from the diaspora. And that we could also drive exports growth through services and not just being reliant on physical goods. However, while I agree that Nigeria's exportation of physical goods is constrained in the international market, I view that the country should also invest uh, in capital infrastructure. Without the capital infrastructure and improving our habitats, we can't develop or grow our human capital. We can grow the entrepreneurs and innovative people who can imagine different possibilities. We need the right habitat. We need electrical infrastructure. We need telecommunications. We need uh, the housing. People have to live comfortably in conducive habitats to be able to think correctly. Then the need for growth across the country and he identified the catalyst for growth as the innovation hubs, industrial clusters, and education. I agree that we need education and government needs to invest 
in education for the future generation. And the need to standardize the informal to the formal sector and how we can formalize the informal sector so that they contribute to the economy and also to the government fiscus. And the, he spoke about the business environment as well, the very difficult business environment operating in Nigeria, showing that Nigeria needs to improve on its ease of doing business so that entrepreneurial individuals can set up more businesses and provide more jobs. He identified Nigeria's big three distortions and that there's a need for structural policy reforms as they are largely distorted. And these big three distortions that we identified were the exchange rate, fuel subsidy, and Nigeria's power and electricity industry. For the exchange rate, uh, he suggested that this should operate market determined rates, which I'm not totally, I don't totally agree because I'm afraid uh, the market determined rates are also distorted based on capital flight from the country. And as for fuel subsidy, I see no reason why an oil producing country should not build its own infrastructure and produce refined petroleum products instead of relying on the importation of fuel leading to the need for subsidy. In South Africa, they have so many refineries, although they are not an oil producing country. So this is something that has to be uh, re, uh, investigated and developed by the country. Then the Nigeria power and electricity industry, which is stated as being uh, beset by non-cost reflective tariff because of no, but this is because of no investment in infrastructure. I tend to disagree with the non-cost reflective tariff. I think the problem is there's no investment in infrastructure in this sector. And there's a need to reconcile income and operations and maintenance expenses and the capital expenditure. I'm of the view that consumers and stakeholders are just being taken for granted in the electricity generation in the country. The utility companies are, should be held accountable for the state of the electricity generation and distribution in the country. And shifting from the GDP lens to the SDG lens, yes, policies should be focused on achieving the global goals for sustainable development. However, we also need policies to know how well our economy is doing. And on climate change, yes, there's a need to balance our need to live sustainably because the need for sustainable development may limit the development of our infrastructure as well. So there's a need for a balance there. So we can't use coal-fired power plants with the new sustainable uh, need for climate change. So there's a need for that balance. Do we need to have coal-fired power plants, which we have coal in Nigeria, to balance it off with the uh, uh, need for electricity or with the need to uh, maintain the, uh, bring down the CO2 emissions coming from this coal-fired power plant. So there's a need for a balance. So what are my solutions? So one of the solutions identified by Dr. Nevin is the use of brain drain as a national strategy. I view that Nigeria can become the first country to embrace that brain drain, brain capital as a core strategy. I mean, he, made his, he said the use of brain capital, not brain drain, brain capital as a national strategy. So it can become the first country to embrace brain capital as a core strategy, I agree. However, to do this, we need the conducive habitats, investment in infrastructure, and the decolonization of the mind to find our own development path. Decolonization has to come first of all. We have to acknowledge that our teaching came from the colonialists, the British system, the world knowledge theory, 
means that the European system is different from what the same knowledge can be used and applied to African systems and their challenges. So what this means is that we need to create our own path. We need to uh, use the same theory, but apply it in different ways. So when people are saying, talking about, for example, robots, using robots in construction and so on, we have so many people who are unemployed and we don't have a very good standard system which we can tax the capitalists who will be using the robots. So they take the jobs. But if you compare the application of robots in the developed world, this is acceptable because they don't have the population to um, make use of intensive labor in construction, for example. While we have all that labor who are unemployed, who are not being fully employed, who are not being used, and then we want to bring in robots. So we have to balance this carefully. We have to use this theory, but we have to apply it to our own challenges in different ways, in more innovative ways. So what I'm also saying is that we have to show we are, are competitive in what we know. We are living locally in a global space. We have to develop knowledge that is locally relevant, but internationally impactful. We have to leverage our local knowledge to become internationally competitive, even if it's in the African, on the African continent. It is usually who has, who has the narrative that's going to dictate where the world will go. It's time for Nigeria, for Africa to also start to dictate that narrative. So Nigerian built environment professionals have to provide competitive services develop competitive organizations that can export their services, not only human capital. We also have to start exporting services in terms of quantity surveying consultancies beyond the borders of Nigeria, like consulting companies such as PwC. Export of services shows that Nigerian built environment professionals can contribute not only effectively and professionally to the delivery of the much needed infrastructure in Nigeria, but also beyond the borders of Nigeria. In conclusion, there's so much work to be done, a huge deficit in housing, infrastructure, transportation, energy, our refineries, our manufacturing, schools, so many things to mention in Nigeria. The built environment professionals should be business-minded, work towards seeing possibilities and Packaging projects becoming highly visible in the international space. They must be productive and highly efficient. Do much more with little resources. Uphold the ethics of the profession. Do what is right and also work with integrity. They have to develop a common goal, strategize to achieve that common goal. This should be mapped and agreed to by professionals in the built environment. So with that, I think I'll want to stop here for now. Thank you all so very much for listening. It has been a real honor participating in the Distinguished Lecture Series, and I wish you fruitful deliberations. Thank you so much. Let's give uh, a resounding round of applause, please. It reminds me of those days at one of the lecture halls back then in University of Lagos. This is just how she used to deliver her speech. Very soft-spoken and yet, you know, very pregnant with, very erudite, you know, rich resources. When she speaks, you know, you will know that a professor is speaking. Another round of applause for her, please. At this junction, before we proceed to the next uh, item on the agenda, we would like to recognize and honor the presence of the past chairman, one of the past chairman of NIQS Lagos State Chapter, uh, QS Ayonda Adenike. Thank you very much, Ma, for your support. Also, we would like to honor and regard the presence of QS Theophilos Egu, our uh, Secretary, International Affairs, NIQS. Thank you very much for your presence. 
Uh, now, moving on, we'd like to call on our chief host to come and do a kind of recapitulation to all that have been said today so that he can further drive home the message. So you will all have uh, handy what to take home. So we'll call on our president, the president of the Nigerian Institute of Conservators, QS Hartor. Please take the floor. Very important invited guest, the erudite keynote speaker and discussants. Once again, want to appreciate all of you for doing justice <coughs> to the topic as it is. Let me begin by highlighting the presentation of the 17 development goals, the 17 SDGs, and narrowing them down to the 10 goals recommended by the keynote speaker. That's the way to go if we have to really achieve recovery and also uh, push down the insecurity issues in the country. The 10 goals recommended are highly recommended to all of us to look at them. And he did not end without charging us again on what are the roles quantity surveyors are expected to play. That question is very pregnant. And it is our own duty and responsibility to critically evaluate the emerging and traditional roles of quantity surveyors aimed at impacting the national economy. So it is very, very important for us to put that at the front banner. The second discussions deal with issues related to sustainability and then why is it important for us to consider sustainability issues. He discussed so much about content metrics in project delivery. He really elaborated extensively that uh, delivering projects within cost, completion period, and even quality are not the only issues required to satisfy, to achieve customer satisfaction. You have contending uh, metrics, or if you want to call them interests. So it is important for us to really, if we have questions, to ask him to elaborate further, because you will find them very, very important, and you might not just come across them easily in your day-to-day -day practices. So the contending metrics issues are important. At some times, some consideration might come over and ahead of cost consideration, completion period, or even quality. I totally agree with that submission, and we have to look at them. He did not end without first rolling out the opportunities abound within the country for satisfactory and fulfilling quantity surveying practices. A lot of, he now gave the rundown of abundant projects at the federal level, projects at the state level, at corporate level, private level, so on and so forth. If you look at all of them, it means we have enormous opportunity to tap into, right? But then he warned that there are disruptions in achieving that. So in order to overcome those disruptions, he suggested so many emerging technology issues, information and communication technology issues for us to embrace. Otherwise, we'll be left behind. As he mentioned, the world has been going through so many stages of revolution but we are still at the first, or at best, close to the second. So it means we are far behind. And unless we scale up our technology, embrace, embrace emerging technology, we cannot tap into those opportunities. That's exactly what he means, okay? So we have to really start working very, very hard, embrace the technology for us to take advantage of the opportunities. It is not just as easy as it is, but you have to really scale up our efforts. Climate change, he discussed extensively on climate change and what are the consequences and effect of climate change on, on our projects, on our practices, and what we need to do in order to ensure that 
we bring on sustainability to bear upon economic recovery of the country. Paper 3 did a very good job by also raising the issues about disruptions and then bringing an issue that is very, very important. To my mind, it's a very critical asset. That is data as a critical asset by way of finding a solution to overcoming economic challenges. So data is so important, data is so critical. If you don't have it, how else can you even plan? I can recall recently the esteemed past president of this country mentioned that we have to manage our population issues. If we don't manage them now, sooner or later we are going to face enormous challenges more than before. And the fact is that we are not handling and managing our population issues. That goes a long way to tell you that data is critical. Without it, how else can you even plan? So these are important considerations for us to look at. And then you have issues about central services in terms of project conceptualization. That has to also be looked at critically. So for the emphasis, data is very, very, very important. It's critical, it's a critical asset. And we just cannot toy with it. For you to plan properly, there must be credible, timely, and relevant data for you to carry out your business, be it at the public or private sector of the economy. The discussions for raise issues which is very, very dear to my heart, industry collaboration, very, very important. We have to come together. None of the bodies within the built industry can do it alone, and that is a fact. I totally agree with that. So it's an advocate, and we are on the same page with that sort of advocacy. Let us come together, all the engineers, quantity surveyors, architects, unless we team up, how else can we go solo? It's not possible, it's not feasible. That recommendation is very, very important. And I hope and pray that this lecture series will be given enough sufficient coverages all across the country because of the content of what we had. And they are very, very important for uh, achieving our goals and especially in order to meet up the she discussed about issues about the uh, before now uh okay that is issue about economic diversification we are still maintaining this monoproduct economy is dangerous we have to really diversify if we don't diversify we just keep on marking time while the entire world is moving smart housing solutions are key we have to really embrace that that is the way to go very well thank you so very much very important now, discussant five discuss about the opportunities again in the housing sector. You, you have 17 to 21 million deficit, depending on the data you are using. But let's even take the lower data, the lower figure of 17 million. It is still okay. All right, I will rush. Even let's even look at the 17 million housing deficit. It is quite enormous. But can we just can we just access it? Without really opening our game, we cannot. So we have to work very hard in those areas. There are issues about ease of doing business. That is cardinal. It's germane. So if you want to be competitive, you have to provide very, very conducive environment for, for investors to come in and even those within the country to carry out their businesses under conducive and convenient atmospheres. Otherwise, you just cannot be competitive in the marketplace. There is an issue that was now introduced, which is very dear to my heart, brain capital as a solution to achieving economic recovery. Brain capital is not brain drain. The professor actually, actually she said she doesn't want to refer to it as brain drain, but rather it is brain capital as a solution to achieving economic recovery. Now, we have to really uh, look at the competitive services to dwell on service provision, not only products, but then even in services, exportable commodities, bringing it down to even exporting quantity surveying services. I'm so happy with this, and I believe all of you are happy that we should not only look at provision of quantity surveying services within the country, but also outside Nigeria, as the case may be. But she did not end without raising the issues about ethical conduct and, and, uh, and standard. In discharging our duties, we have to conduct ourselves ethically and in line with code of conducts. That uh, I'm happy because we just recently launched a document 
our code of ethics and professional conduct is available for free, I believe, at the liaison office and also the headquarters in Abuja. Because of time constraints, I understand our flight is almost, so I have to leave. Otherwise, I would have been here for us to really take on more of this because this is one of the most important sessions we're attending. You know, so much to learn. I'm highly enriched. And particularly those of us who do modules on sustainability issues. If you look at how serious they consider outside elsewhere, you will remember that here we haven't started at all. Issues about climate change, reduction of carbon emission, and sustainability, ensuring that we don't deny the upcoming generation by our wrong and, and, and uh, poor practices in ensuring that we want to consume everything and leaving nothing to the upcoming generation will not guarantee sustainability at all. Thank you so very much. At this point, I have to end. And then the session has to continue. You, are, you have questions. Don't lose these opportunities because they are around. You should have started writing your questions and let them take them one after the other. So at the tail end, we now can get the best out of this session. God bless you all. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, President Kiwe Sabato. Before you leave, sir, the discussant and the member of NECDA run and past chairman, will you please come up for a quick uh, photograph with the president before he leaves? Thank you very much. We wish uh, the president and his entourage a safe trip back to Abuja. God bless. Please, if there is any more question, we have some here. If we have any more question, you can pass it through the or shares or send it online.
why we why we send up the chairman the president i welcome uh, mr shadari to please give the goodwill message from qs uh, the permanent secretary for the uh, ministry of housing legal states a round of applause for him mr shadari a goodwill message from qs Akewishola. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the President, Nigerian Institute of Quantity Surveyor, the Chairman, Lagos State Chapter, the Flagship Chapter, the Keynote Speaker, ably represented by Dr. K, other discussants, other protocols duly extended. On behalf of Mr. Kewishola Wasiu Adidamala, FNIQS, the Permanent Secretary, Minister of Housing, I want to congratulate and facilitate with the organizers of this 13th Annual Distinguished Light Show. And I also want to tender a non reserved apology on his behalf for his unavoidable absence at today's event. It is not intentional, but due to exigency of his, his schedule. The Lagos State Civil Service has been observing his Civil Service Week, and today being one of the most important day in the week, during which awards have been presented to deserving staff in the state by Mr. Governor. All PAM secretaries are, permanent secretaries are expected to grace the occasion. That is the major reason why he could not be here. However, I would like to congratulate the organizer once again for bringing erudite professionals and discussants to discuss on today's theme, which is economic recovery and provision of sustainable infrastructure amidst security challenge in our country, Nigeria. The roles of professionals in the built environment. Though I am an admin and human resources practitioner, but my coming here today to represent my permanent secretary have been of immense benefit to me. And I've gained a lot from the speakers in their thought-provoking lectures. On this note, I want to give kudos once again to the legacy Sharper uh, on behalf of Mr. Akeu Shola. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another round of applause for him. He's giving my best wishes. Thank you very much. Now we've come to the question segment of the program. Some questions are already here with me. I'm going to read them. And some of them have been provided with responses. I'll also read their responses. So if you still have your own questions, please kindly forward it through the ushers. So we'll be taking questions now. So it's now time for questions, question time. So the first question I'm going to read here comes from our able chairman, QS Ayo. Allow. Mr. Bola Abisogun spoke about the reaction of quantity surveyors with regards to data. In this present era, how do we manage the long-term impact of open data on quantity surveying profession, especially where there is possibility of such open data ideology to invade our profession boundaries, our professional boundary? Can we actually protect this boundary in this era? So that's the first question we're treating, and it goes to QS Bola Abisogu. And he has actually sent in a response to that, which goes thus. Data is being and will continue to be democratized. Having data in a redundant capacity is pointless. Who actually owns the data that you have or you think you have? 
you own. In construction delivery terms, it is the client or the key stakeholders who owns the data. So such data should be shared and the true value proposition of it being leveraged by the entire design teams and others, including students in the tertiary institutions to stimulate innovation. Structured data is the new black gold. That's the response from QS Bola Abisogun. Let's give him a round of applause. Also, we're taking another question from Professor, okay, uh, that was poised to Professor Windakbo. The question says, Professor Windakbo spoke about educational system. How do we blend our Western education system with our indigenous market needs? I think uh, she would respond to that. So when we get our response, we'll equally read that out as well. So any other question now? Before we wrap up. So you can send in your questions before we wrap it up today. Yes, contribution, okay. You have a contribution as well? All right, take it to QS Bodaji Shotunde. All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, standing on existing protocol, my name is QS Bolaji Shotunde. First and foremost is to say, um, congratulations to the, to the flagship chapter and also members of the Senate for putting together this wonderful yearly event, irrespective of the COVID era, but you've been able to bring everybody together. It's very good to be Sorry. Hello. Okay. All right. Let me just. Hello. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to pick on two things. Um, the first is concerning <clears throat> um, the the collaboration. Okay, that was mentioned. Um, particularly, I think taking an overview of the participant here, you probably clearly understand that when you say the next stage of professionalism when it comes to Lagos states are those ones here and quite frankly this is a generation that is also trying to get on board a lot of us seated on this part of the aisle are probably working under an institution or working under a principle or an organization okay that also now needs to talk about sustainability in their own way so the issue has always been how do we merge okay how do we merge this side of the divide with this side of the divide in such a way that there's continuity because when you talk about sustainability in the environment you also need to start from the profession itself and collaboration is key in this regard okay in, we need to begin to look for ways where the younger generations are integrated all right along okay with the system that is already in play all right if everybody working on that somebody here will go out okay and start developing which their own system, which nobody is saying it is, it is wrong. But when you have something on ground that is good already, how can we sustain it? How can we keep the experience merged together in such a way that we can all grow together as a team? Beyond our home profession also, how then do we also begin to reach out to other professions to build this sustainability? So I think collaboration is very important and just to emphasize that. The second thing I would like to say is this. Programs like these are also usually used to, to speak to the state government. And I'm glad Madam is here, and I'm told we can hold you down and hold you responsible. All right, or you can get to the governor. This is Lagos State. This is the face of quantity surveyors in, in Lagos State. The gentleman who has spoken has spoken about having 
abandoned project also in Lagos State, all right? So the NIQS Lagos chapter is also trying to make a statement here that we need to get more involved. More involved does not necessarily mean that we are critiquing the government, but we need to find a way for the government to also create that room and that vacuum so that we can easily step in and, and, and do what is required of us as the professionals. Not to go back to the era of engineers everywhere, but again, sustainability, like you have rightly said, does not stop on the table of the engineers. In recent times, when you are having your technical qualification as a QS coming to a table for a project, what they are asking you is not only just about the price of cement and concrete. They, are want, to, they want to hear from you. If this project is going to be a 10 billion naira project, what can you bring to the table that might reduce this project? Your understanding of building materials, your understanding of building science is important. And that is not necessarily left for the engineers alone. So there is much more that the conditions of yours can bring to the table. I want to appeal to the Lagos State Government. Uh, you earn a fee. Now, I also talk about the power sector. Our current generation capacity is just merely about 5,000 megawatts. And out of that 5,000 megawatts, we're only able to transmit about 2,600 uh, megawatts of it. And we have a population of 180 million people, uh, going to 200 million now. So it has been estimated that our demand is on the minimum at least 30,000 megawatts if we're going to provide electricity access to uh, everybody in Nigeria. So, uh, what are we doing? Now, I heard uh, Dr. Uh, is it Nevin talking about non-reflective uh, tariff. In my head, I was already saying no. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, Professor Windapo came to address that. It's not only the issue of non-reflective uh, tariff. We have issue of energy loss, estimated billing, and we have the Electric Sector Power Reform Act of 2005 that has addressed some of these issues. So, what are we doing as professionals? Now, uh, because you are, you are an engineer and you are in the public sector, I feel that you also have a lot of say uh, when you get to a uh, forum like Corrin, NSC, to say, no, this is where we should focus. Let's look at the electric, uh, electric sector power reform act. You talked about uh, meter set providers. Uh, are we ensuring that there's universal metering? Are we uh, ensuring that there's no energy leakage? Uh, how we can start increasing tariff? So all these things are things that we think, I think we need to work on. Uh, present the common front for uh, advocating for policy reform, not infighting, oh, I should do this, you should do this. So that's just my message. Let me just add to that and um, quickly inform engineer Mrs. Salayinka Abdul that um, we may not be able to touch on all of it here and as such, we are proposing to pay you a court service it, and especially Lagos State Public Works Corporation. So be expecting us, one, in ampersation, and secondly, to further this discussions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much um, to the gentleman that um, spoke on um, collaboration, bridging the gap between the younger ones and the 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 not the senior. I won't consider myself as a senior. I'm not 90 yet. I'm just, um, I'm still growing. Now, I think um, for every principles that you have there, my ideology is I should be able to produce five of me. How do you mentor? Do you have mentees of some of these people here today? How are you relating with them? We should, by now, boldly be able to say, in this profession, not even only QS, in some other profession, it might not even be built. You should at least be able to say categorically, I have five replacements for myself. If we do that sincerely, I think we're gonna move the mountains. The mountains won't be there again, but a lot of us are not doing it. We're too busy pursuing money. We're too busy doing that. We're not impacting and transmitting our knowledge. So the younger ones don't learn well. They learn things they pick on the road. You know, a welfare child is different from the one on the street that just eats on anybody's door, anybody's table. There's the difference. The language they speak, 
their purportment, their courage is just different. Despite the fact that they are born the same day, the same age. So I would liken it that to us. If you, if we as a group, and as I keep saying, it's about us, not a single profession now. Let us see ourselves as a team. The built industry is not seeing themselves as a team. We are seeing ourselves, I'm an architect, he's an engineer, he's a QS, he's a town planner. No. Until we begin to shelve all those mentality, what are we passing to the future? And the futures are those up scale. They are yet unborn. Some are just in primary school. If we are sincere, I think we'll get around it. So let each and every one of us collaborate by mentoring many more. Mentor them in every form positively so that you are sure your integrity, your skill has been multiplied. And they themselves, that means in another five, 10 years, you would have 50 of you in the country. Do you understand? The, the next, because you've done something positive to that one, he picks some other five people. And if he has more capacity, he can even take more. Some might take three. It doesn't mean, but let us just start it. Begin to mentor today. Let it be part of the NIQS programs that you have to mentor. And start mentoring them right from when they are young. Not like the Yoruba people will say, when they have a new key. Do you understand? Catch them young. Mentor them like that. And let's see what the nation holds for us. Thank you. Also, we have maintenance problem in this country, as we all know. Maybe what most of us maintain more is our cars. And that's because we see them, we use them on daily basis. Most people's homes go there, they are zinc, they will tie rope on the tap. It's leaking, they know. But to call plumber to fix it up, the WC is leaking water. People just, until maybe when it's very, very bad, you go to the backyard of someone's house, the sewer lines, they've cracked, fixed, no. We have maintenance problem. The culture, I don't know, um, uh, uh, there was a time we were integrating with schools that maintenance should be taught as core subjects in schools. And some schools that we visited during our interactive sections with them, they've started taking it, but um, I've moved again up. I've not um, followed up in a while. But if I believe that we take this thing back to the grassroots, we teach ourselves young things we need to do. Some of the nursery rhymes I learned when I was in primary school, way back, I was singing it. I can still recite it. And I learned it way back. Do you understand? So, so some of those things become an integral part of you. You can't just do away with them. If we know the, the, the meaning, the effect of having good maintenance culture, and we as individuals have decided that this is my Bible. I must abide by it. Then a lot of things will change. And because, again, I'll, I'll, I'll take from the Yoruba adage that says, we, we take, um, I don't know how to interpret that in English. Charity begins. Charity begins at home. So it is what you start doing right at home that would impact on your community and on your society and to the whole of the country. After all, who are the governments? Um, it's not Buhari that is government, too. It's not Mr. Sanwulu that is government. It's not uh, this man, uh, NMPC, Abba Kiari, that is government. It is you and I. It is all of us. It is how we sit, what we make of them, that they become. They didn't come from heaven just like that. They grew up as part of us to be who they are. Now, you have a, um, to the gentleman. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. I believe that professionals, we are selfish somehow. What we are after is 
what is the need for me? What is the need for us? Not what can commonly be shared. If you grew up in uh, Nigeria, in your state, as I grew up, when they put food in a bowl, you don't pick it the same amount to feed. Someone will eat more. Um, someone will eat less. But the thing is, all of you will be fed. And if you have a small wisdom, when you look at the plate and you see the bar is going down or the rice is going down, is it that you do you do your hand like this, you just pack some, and you get up from their midst. You know that this is the quantity that I'm taking home with. And you go and eat it. And you are contented. Do you understand what I'm saying? But in the event that there is a food on the plate for all of us to share, someone is already thinking, these seven people around me, these are my brothers, my sister. How can I beat them out of it? How can all this food be mine? How can all this food be mine? Somebody is, somebody is thinking, if it can't be mine, then I'll throw it, I'll kick it off. Some of us do it. The same profession. The same profession. You are given something to do. How you sideline the other person is what is up on your mind. You begin gossip, you begin a lot of other things. That's when you know that man, mad alone, is oh man, yeah, a bit con. You things that is not relevant to what is on the table. People begin to bring those sentiments into things. So as professionals, I believe we have not broken that ceiling yet because we are not sincere. Our integrity is questionable. And unfortunately, I would say we are the main cause of the problem in this country. Sincerely. Whether engineers or whether QSO, town plan, the professionals, the ones that know the deal, are you quantifying right? Mm. Am I doing the right thing when I get to site? Am I not compromising? If you are to give someone a detail, what kind of details do you give the person? You know the, the, the normal practice is, is the person that designs in engineering is not the person that is supposed to supervise or to do the, that's the way it is. But someone will go and meet the guard and say, don't mind that man. Or because you want to be the designer. You know where, if you don't do this, probably something will drop that you go and share. <laughs> so you, it's the same engineer. But you say, no, 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 no. Oga, omo ye omo share. It's not his, if the, the, the guy or the lady doesn't know, why don't you teach? Why don't you mentor the person on that project that this is how it's done so that the person learn directly from you that you feel you know it well or you know it better. So for me, integrity matters. Do we all as professionals have that 100% integrity around us? Do we sincerely? Let us search ourselves as we are seated. What is the level of your integrity? What is the level of my integrity on any project that we are on? Are we not just paying deep service? If, you, if we sit as, a, as um, a team, you go to government. Now, you, for me, this lecture series, I don't expect us to have 10 communique. 10 communique for what? That's what has been we've been doing in the last 20 years and it has yielded nothing. Can't we pick one or two? One or two communicate from this lecture series, then we drive it. We drive it. We, dri we make sure that in the next nine months, we want to achieve just one or two. When you are going to meet someone, it's the same song you are singing. Even the Bible said, the wicked uh, king allowed, heard what the woman wanted, yielded to her. Because she's not going with numerous things, though. It's just one. Avenge me of my adversaries. Afternoon. King, avenge me of my adversary. So, thank you. But I just believe that let us be sincere and holistic and let us see ourselves in the built industry 
as a team. If you go as a team to government, you can prefer solution. Who says you, as in the built industry now, can't decide to have an estate, professional estate or whatever we call it. You design, you quantify homes that will not be more than two million, one million, what material, let the architect come up with ideals, let the engineer come up with structural things. Oh, we don't want to use more than this. We don't want to use more than this. You quantify it and you make sure that the specifications are there and let us build, let us show the world, let us show the country. We shouldn't be afraid to fail. Let us get it right. We shouldn't be afraid to fail. When we fail on something, it doesn't mean we should crucify ourselves, but learn from that mistake, improve on it, and forge ahead. And we'll get there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma. Let's put our hands together for engineer Olayinka Abdul. Now we're going to quickly take another contribution, the final contribution from uh, Dr. Ayodeji. Okay. So yes. let's have your contribution, please. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm totally in support of the thing she has Please, in two minutes, sir. Collaboration. But thank I just you. want to come in. You know, I'm actually coming from the academics. And uh, I wouldn't know if you have some of us here. This issue is also affecting us in academics. Uh, for instance, I'm from Futa. And if you have your Korean and then you have your PhD, you move straight to lecturer one. But if you have your QSRBN, Alcon, any of those things with your PhD, you remain in lecturer too. So that means your colleagues are already three years ahead of you. And the, the major reason is because you are not coming together. The QS will go and fight on their own. The architects will go and fight on their own. The town planners will go. I'm talking of almost 20, 30 years ago. And we are still having the issue up to this moment. So I want to agree that uh, first of all, we should come together as built environment professionals as much as possible. Because I'm sure when uh, mechanic engineers want to fight, they will not go as mechanic engineers. It's going to be as Korean, you know. So we, also, we, actually, we just need to come together. I think that will actually help. Then I also want to say as much as possible, industry, academic collaboration, TAN and GANG. Most of the researches we are doing in the university these days, we don't have any problem we are solving. Why? Because the people are there. You are not giving us any problem to solve. And our students must graduate. So that means they must look for a problem and solve. And most times you blame us that uh, our books are just on the shelf. They are not uh, solving any problem. The question, you are not bringing problems to us. So I want to charge us as well. Uh, partners of firms and the rest. I mean, you can come around and fund researches. We have this issue. Take this money. Go and do it for us. It's part of the collaboration we are talking about. We cannot be doing our thing in the university system, academic system, whereas also doing our things in the practice, and we expect to move ahead. No, go and check all those European countries that have developed. It's because there is a synergy between the academic as well as the industry. So I think a collaboration should also extend beyond that. So I'm hoping that after now, uh, we will start feeling the impact of all our bodies in our institutions. Thank you. Another resounding applause for Dr. Ayodigi, okay? Thank you very much. It's been worthwhile having you here. Uh, we'll take one last final uh, question or contribution. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Osas. Yeah, I'm a student of Federal University of Technology, Akure Futa. Yeah, I'm a foreign level student. I'm doing my IT in Lagos here. Yeah. yeah, my question is, They've said about twin building, construction management. These basic things we are talking about are not done in school. We are young generations. We are growing. Life has done, gone before taking off, as countries of are taking off in the book, doing other things. How can the institute help us? Is it in reviewing our curriculum? Because yeah, there was an hand that I was using then. My dad friend, the QS, over 20 years, said that same hand that he used it. And I'm, this is 2021. And my dad friend has been working for over 20 years. So how can the institute help us assist the, is it to change the curriculum now? I believe in school, this, um, my wonderful um, doctor, he really gave us experience for us to understand things about 
how we can make construction better, talking about twin building, talking about the use of cloud computing to help construction. How can the institute contribute to make country surveying better for undergrad? Because I believe professor, um, professionals that are here will not say, okay, they want to divert to go into twin building. Maybe he's specialized in construction economy. So we the young ones that are coming up. So how can the institute help us? to embrace if it's want to go about because there are other okay i have friends that have started up in construction now how is the institute supporting them so that's my question thank you very much we'll pass that uh, question on to uh dr ayodeji kindly respond to that please thank you okay uh, thank you for the question first and uh, i want to state that uh, in school we should know that uh, we are to first of all learn about theory and we should know the traditional ways of doing things. That should be fundamental, even before we proceed to any other things. Of course, I'm not here to like, uh, share some of the lecturers who does that, I mean. And that is why we are here talking about rules of professionals. Those lecturers, so they are professionals. One way or the other will contribute, you know. But uh, I want to say that as much as possible, in as much as they will continue to teach the basis and the most important thing. And that is why most time after, like, if you are in, uh, Maybe you, you went to Polytechnic after your two years. You actually go for IT, one year IT. And the same thing for us in university. After your, I mean, for, uh, first semester from the level, you go on IT to learn. Uh, I must tell you, Mr. USA, when I went for my own IT, that was the first time I actually know how to use the software. That was when the Master Bill and QS card was introduced in the country. Nobody would teach me because, I mean, who would sponsor them to go and learn? You understand what I mean? Who will buy the software? As at that time, that software can buy you a Prado Jeep. I mean, as at that time. So which institution we want to go and invest such an amount of money into software? In fact, I'm sorry to say this. Currently, we are preparing for accreditation. We are preparing for professional accreditation. And the vice chancellor told us that he has no business with professional accreditation. That if it's NUC, Nigeria University Commission, no problem. But with professional, he's gaining nothing from them. So what do we do? We have to like levy the students to contribute money. Why? Because we are expecting NIQS and QSRBN. I don't know, I don't know if you get it. It's the same students that were, that were to be accredited, so to speak, are not the one contributing to pay the NIQS and QSRBN that will be coming to school. So do not expect us to go ahead and buy software when we don't have the money. Who will raise the money? The same VC that says it's not interested. You understand now? So we have all of these issues. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, whatever you have learned in school, see it as the foundation. See it as the basis. Now that you are out there, build on it, and I'm sure you'll be uh, a better QS. Thank you Thank very you. much. Another round of applause, please. Thank you so much. Uh, now we're gradually drawing to the end of the program, and we will now like to call on our deputy chairman, NIQS Lagos State Chapter. QS Olan Rewaju Farutimi, FNIQS, to come and give us the vote of thanks. Let's clap for him, please. And I just want to add that um, whatever platform that you are, this is a continuous, uh, a continuous thing that we can still go on to discuss on our different platforms. Thank you. Just before we move to the vote of thanks, we would like to honor our guest, invited guest, who have come very far, from very far and near to grace this occasion. 
and we want to show a bit of our appreciation by appreciating your contribution today. Uh, and as you can see, you have been listening to around the globe. People have, you know, your contributions are going to travel far and wide. And we continue to pray that God continue to increase you in more knowledge and wisdom. So we want to appreciate your presence and your contribution. So we'll now call on uh, our General Secretary, Nigerian Institute of Conservio, Secretary for, sorry, Secretary for International Affairs, QS Theophilus Ego, to come and present uh, the plaque for Dr. Okay. Okay. Professor Isaac Olani Yaji, represented by our Herodite Scholar, QS uh, <laughs> Ayodeji. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, on behalf of Lagos State Chapter, I haven't done justice to the, to the team of the lecture. And you have been ably represent uh, you know, Professor Ajay, and we are glad with the with your lecture, what you've discussed with us here today. We hereby want to say a thank you is a token. Please, can you kindly take this to Prof? We appreciate your your coming on behalf of Lagos Chapter. Looking for the job well done. Round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Ayodeji. Okay. We'll rightly call on um, QA's. Okusaga to please uh, present a uh, plug on appreciation to engineer Mrs. Olai in Kabdo. Thank you very much, Ma. Careful. On behalf of uh, Nigerians of Ponds of your Lagos chapter, we say a big thank you for honoring our invitation, and we wish that when next we call you, you will definitely come. We really appreciate your time and your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you very much, Ma. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for those uh, QSs that are not around, those that participated online, I'm sure they will also get theirs as well. So let's give a resounding applause to all of them for all their contributions. So now we'll now go to the vote of thanks by QS Olari. You follow to me. FNI QS. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, KS Asan Okuli and QS Lolade Shokoya for a job well done. Uh, on behalf of uh, the chairman and the entire Senate members uh, of NIQS Lagos chapter, I want to sincerely appreciate everyone who has made this edition of the DLS uh, a success. Uh, let me start by thanking sincerely the president of the Nigerian State of Pontus of Yours, QS Mohamed Abato, uh, who is the chief host and also the chairman of this occasion. Uh, despite his very tight schedule, uh, 
I understand there was a NEC meeting, an NPC meeting uh, two days, uh, I think yesterday and day before yesterday, and he still had the uh, grace to come to Lagos for this event. Uh, we appreciate that and we are highly honored. I also want to appreciate uh, all the NEC members present, uh, both past and present NEC members. We thank you for taking our time to grace this uh, event. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your coming. God bless you. Uh, this occasion will not have been quite successful without the immense support that we got from all our sponsors, uh, QS Firms, FOAB Partnership, Costec Consultants, DuFranc and Partners Limited, Ficanto, Project Services Limited, Egypt Denonia and Partners, uh, corporate bodies, corporate organizations, ITB Nigeria Limited, Dulux, uh, VACC Technical Limited, Lambert Electromech, Ledge Roofing, Julius Berger PLC, and Formwork Limited. Uh, we also want to thank individuals, uh, QS Bamidele, Mafi Midiwo uh, of BAM Associates for your support. Uh, we thank QS Annette OK uh, for your support. Uh, we also thank uh, QS Yetunde Simplis also for your financial and moral support. Uh, God will continue to take you and your firms to greater heights. I also want to thank our guest speakers and discussants, uh, starting with the keynote speaker, Dr. Andrew S. Nevin, PhD, all our discussants, uh, Professor Isaac Olani Ajay, ably represented by the Herodot Scholar, Dr. Ayodeji, okay. Uh, Mr. Bola Bisogun, uh, OBE, FRCS. Professor Abimbola Windapo, uh, Linda Onefeli, who could not attend due to heal it. Uh, Engineer Olainka Adol, FNSC. We thank you all uh, for accepting to be speakers and discussants at this great occasion. Uh, we also want to thank our media team uh, for projecting this event uh, to the world. Uh, to all of you seated here, you can imagine if the discussants, the speakers are here and you are not here, you know, this event would not have been successful. So you guys are the real VIPs. Uh, a round of applause to everyone seated. So we thank you all for taking time out to come, and we want to wish you a safe journey back to your furious destinations. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you very much, QAs. Olanri, why did you follow to me? We want to appreciate the presence of um, Mrs. Linda Onofeli. She's supposed to be the fourth discussant. That I said that Lara wasn't feeling too strong to come, but she has been online. We appreciate our presence online, and we wish her a speedy recovery. We are rounding off finally, and um, we are doing the national anthem. So I want to implore all of us to please rise on our feet for the national anthem. On our feet, we will take the closing prayer to be taken by QS Bola Shotunde. Thank you.
Heavenly Father, we we'll thank you for yet this successful event. We we'll appreciate you for all that we've learned. We we'll appreciate you for all that um, you brought to our understanding. As we go, we we'll pray you go with us and bring good tidings to every one of us. Thank you for this institute and we we'll pray forever. We we'll continually grow in your grace and wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much, everybody. A round of applause for ourselves. We have done well by being here. Please, as you go out, there are refreshments. There is no need to rush. Please, there is no need to rush. Let us be orderly. There is enough to go around for everybody. Thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs>